Okay, welcome everybody. I hope you have a good experience today. I'm Lino Meta. I'm one of the four organizers of this workshop. Uh, together with me is Robert Waterhouse and Joanna Maluksiewicz. Sorry if I mispronounce your surname, Joanna. And uh, Nadezhda should uh, join us very soon. Um, so as you heard, you are please encouraged to participate to discussions throughout the session. So please raise your hands whenever you want. We will have question and answer sessions at the end of each uh, presentation. So we will leave that time dedicated to your to answer your questions. Um, before starting with the uh, with the presentations, I would like you just to give a small introduction about this workshop, why we decided to do it, and what you should expect from it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, it's everything. Just let me. Okay, so I hope. Do you can you can somebody just tell me if the screen is up? Okay, so this is a workshop. Uh, the title, as you may know, is Bidding High Quality Reference Genome Assemblies of Eukaryotes, has been organized by four members of ERGA. And I'll give you just an explanation of why we decided to give this workshop and what ERGA is in, first, in the first place. So ERGA stands for European Reference Genome Atlas. Uh, is a consortium uh, which has been uh, started uh, um, one, two years ago. And the main mission is to promote and establish high quality genomes for European species. So this my, my, may and is like a big goal, of course, is a mission which uh, has, a, has no end, basically. And uh, this is, uh, we think that this can be achieved through the collaboration of many people working throughout Europe and other, um, also other countries, associated countries. And uh, the main quality of this uh, consortium is to have an inter interdisciplinary nature because many, um, these can be achieved only through a collaboration of many competencies and uh, many, um, knowledge, a lot of knowledge, uh, being, being sampling, taxonomy, DNA extraction, DNA sequencing, genome assembling, data handling, and at the end, genome analysis. So all this is achieved, of course, through the collaboration of many groups that have competencies for one or more tasks, but we cannot think of having all competencies together. So that's why it's very important to collaborate all together. And within ERGA, we have also aims such as creating a collaborative and interdisciplinary network of scientists across the whole Europe and associated countries. And this can be achieved only when many people join uh, this consortium and also connected, uh, connecting all relevant infra infrastructures across Europe. And uh, finally, we would like to stress out also that uh, all the knowledge that comes out from this um, project, big project, this uh, consortium is, uh, um, has to be shared with everybody, both in terms of um, public, but also scientists. And uh, for example, this workshop uh, falls within one of the aims of ERGA, which is to train and uh, uh, transfer knowledge across um, all Europe and also beyond. So that's why also we collaborate, we have partner projects such as the Earth Biogenome Project and other projects within Europe, for example, the Darwin Tree of Life and, and so on. And uh, so uh, at the moment, well, uh, like 10 days ago, 782 members were, were recorded as being part of uh, uh, ERGA, but all of you are welcome to join us. If you visit the website that I report there, I will then probably share the, this web address in the, in the chat. And uh, also if you follow us in, on Twitter, you can have all the information about the, why um, ERGA is important and what you can do for ERGA. So you're highly welcome to join us. And if you have any question, please also get in contact with any member of ERGA, if you know one or with us organizers of this workshop. So going back to the workshop, um, what are the aims of this workshop? 
The first is to introduce methods for chromosome level genome assembly of eukaryote species using long reads. And for this, we will have four speakers. And the first session, Ryan Chiki will introduce us to long read assembly. And then we will have Nadej Guidelmoni, Liam Baudry, and Anne uh, McCartney uh, talking about assembly post processing. Um, we will then move to uh, a session where we, we will talk about evaluate the quality of these assemblies, how to evaluate this with Matthew Berkeley and Mathieu Seppé, and then uh, discuss the relevance of this for all subsequent analyses. So, so why it's important to have reference genomes for to know more about the biology of a single species, but also for ecosystems. And this we will um, talk about it together with Tanya Schwander. And of course, all of you are invited to participate in discussions because it's the only way to uh, to promote also to give importance to, to all of this. So I will give now the word to um, the first speaker of today, we, um, who just joined us um, in last minute, but welcome Ryan Chiki. Uh, so a few words about him. He's a group leader at the Institut de Pasteur in, in Paris. Um, Ryan got his PhD at the University of Rennes, and then he did a postdoc in the United States at Penn State University. Uh, his work is focused on novel algorithms for handling DNA and RNA sequences. And uh, for example, he has developed the assembler MINA in the past, and more recently, he contributed to the HiFi assembler MDBG. Hope I pronounced that right. So please. Um, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lino, um, uh, for the introduction. Can everybody hear me and see my slides? So it's all good. Excellent. Um, so thanks for um, the invitation to speak at this, at this workshop. Um, Robert, Nadej, uh, Lino, Joan, Joanna. Uh, it's a pleasure to to, in, to start the session uh, by introducing the wonderful world of long read genome assembly. Um, and I must apologize for the stress to the organizer for being late uh, uh, in the end on time this, this morning. I absolutely didn't anticipate a national UK event to happen this week and thus make all trains very late. But thankfully, we can proceed with the session and uh, without further ado, um, I'll just briefly mention in my introduction that my previous work has been focused on genome assembly, but uh, nowadays I'm also investigating more generally KML methods, metagenomics, and large scale sequence analysis. At the bottom of the slide, you can see some uh, organisms which I contributed to, uh, to assemble. Uh, this slide, I'm assuming, is uh, very much basics for uh, all of you, but maybe a check for that you are in the correct Zoom meeting. Um, so this process of DNA sequencing and what we're going to talk about today is essentially the last step where going from sequencing data into reconstructed genomes. Nowadays, there are many technologies for sequencing, and I'm assuming during this workshop, we'll mainly talk, for, talk about two of them potentially free. One is not for nanopore, which generate long reads at um, various levels of qualities, but also potentially for sequences. Another technology is, is uh, PacBio with high fi or not reads. And finally, the last technology that may or may not be mentioned in this workshop is Illumina sequencing using especially high c um, that can help complete assemblies. Just to set the scene, wherever I give an introdu introductory talk on genome assembly, I mention the vocabulary. So um, the process consists of sampling what we call reads from, from an unknown genome. And then the assembly process produces an approximation, an hypothesis of the genome to be assembled. And we call it a set of contexts or a set of scaffolds, and that set is called an assembly. We can now celebrate the 44 last years of genome assembly. The first one has been produced in 1977, where it was just a virus that was sequenced and assembled. But um, according to Gene Myers, reading the, pap the paper that is just four pages 
for these projects is, is uh, a must do, which I haven't done yet, but supposedly a well-written paper full of ideas that introduce both the method for sequencing and the methods for the first method for assembly. Fast forward uh, 30 years later, the first human genome was completed and fast forward until last, last year, we finally have a TMR to telomere, which means gapless human genome. There are many applications for genome assembly. I've tried to be exhaustive with, by, with uh, listing them. Of course, the immediate one is to reconstruct the genome, but um, maybe it is not that the same techniques are also applied to reconstruct transcriptomes, metagenomes, and all just focusing on the genes. Once you have a genome assembly, there's multiple steps that can be done immediately from it. One is to elucidate the phylogeny of species, determine the evolution of genes, or focus particularly on insertions of that assembled genome with respect to other previously known genomes, focus only on the SNPs. Um, in, in the context of cancer analysis, there's also cell-free DNA structural variants, which are determined using genome assembly. And finally, collections of assembled genomes are nowadays analyzed using cutting-edge cutting techniques from the field of plant genomics. I'm curious, given the crowd, if there is any major application of assembly that I've completely omitted, please mention it to me on, on the chat. I would be grateful. Just for a minute, a bit of prehistory of genome assembly. I don't know how many of you have used the Mira assembler from 2000, uh, 2008 and, and before. So back in the days, people were already investigating their assemblies by looking at reads and pileups of the reads but align back to the assembly. Nowadays, we don't do that anymore, and the reads are much longer and much more numerous. But back then, it was manageable to actually debug your assembly by looking at such uh, pileups. Uh, continuing this prehistory, the first algorithms that were used to assemble genomes were really looking like the, the picture you see on top. There was an hypothesis that you could reconstruct a genome by finding the shortest string that contains all of your reads. And this is a hard problem in theory, but in practice, it was solved using GRI algorithms in a cap free assembler from before the 2000s. But unfortunately, this is not the right model for genome assemblies, just for the simple reason that repetitions make it such that an assembly is not the shortest common superstring of the reads. So then, a few years later, in uh, 94, there is, uh, in the same year, two people produced, uh, proposed a method to do assembly using graphs, either string graphs or the Bruin graphs. And uh, for them, have been highly successful, and in particular, the Bruin graphs. Um, actually, sorry, there is there's something in the chat. So, is my sound cracky or is it okay? It's good now. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, the Bruin graph has been widely used across genomics in general, and in particular assembly, by looking just at the citation numbers of the Spades assembler or the Trinity Renesic assembler. You can see that it's really a successful model. But more generally, modern genome assembly is really a graph analysis job. And most assemblers produce, uh, produce an assembly through the following three steps. One is to construct a graph, and the nodes are reads or k-mers. I'll talk about that a bit later. And edges correspond to overlaps between sequences and the nodes. So this, there is one such graph shown here. It's not a real one, but just a toy example. And assembly theory will say that there is a way to reconstruct an assembly from this graph, which is to return a path of minimal length that traverses each of the nodes at least one. At least once. You may traverse it multiple times. You can see, for instance, on this graph, you have to travel the loop once and travel the TTA and DSC nodes twice in order to produce the assembly. However, there has been lots of work for the theory of assembly, but it has been somewhat helpful for practical purposes. Because if you look at the succession of results in 2001, uh, Pevner mentioned in a paper that assembly could be solved quickly in linear time. But then later on, it was determined that using a different model, which was a bit more realistic. It was actually NP-hard, which means hard to solve. A bit later on, again, 
by doing a more fine-tuned analysis, it was found that a very surprising results that if you all your repeats are longer than the reads, then assembly is actually polynomial time, which means it can be completed quickly. Of course, uh, there are many sizes of repeats, and that, that uh, first part of the hypothesis is not satisfying. The latest work or works that I can mention in theory is, is perhaps the most realistic one. It, it analyzes whether repeats are shorter than the reads or spanned by the reads, then in that situation, meaning that your reads are long enough, then assembly not only can be polynomial time, that means quick and with a unique solution. So that's the best case. And unfortunately, this best case is never satisfied in practice, but at least the theory is now settled. Back then, when we only had Illumina reads, none of, none of the theories applied because the assembly graph was often disconnected due to coverage problems. So we couldn't find the, we couldn't frame the assembly problem and finding a single path through the graph. That's why people determined that finding context was good enough and they consisted of all the unambiguous paths in the, in the assembly graph. Now with long reads, theory meets practice appears to be possible and in 2017 already there was uh, studies of how to do near perfect assemblies when your reads were long enough either way today it remains true that assembly is not a solved problem especially in terms of performance and also in terms of assembly quality that will be the rest of this workshop i assume um, in terms of performance it takes a lot of ram and a lot of time to, per to perform eukaryote assembly if this sort of um, presentation is attractive to you, I would recommend that you have a look at this paper that mentioned how a computational problem can be formulated and modified um, so that it fits better the biological question. I'll now mention a bit more specifically challenging instances, which are vertebrates and new genomes. You may remember from before CHM13 and TCT, was released, which is actually just two years ago, uh, human genome was highly fragmented in terms of quantity and 50, I mean, in terms of quantity. So if you look on the left, you can look, you can see a diagram where each different core, each band corresponds to a quantity. And so each chromosome was very much consisting of hundreds of quantities. Scaffold wise, meaning in the order of quantities, it was way better, but really there are gaps, lots of gaps. Those gaps have been um, painfully solved by, by a team in a few years, a few years ago, and they published their results this year. I'll mention it later. And now uh, our recent reference for human has a much higher contiguity and much longer context. But this was done with progress in algorithms, but also progress in data quality. The reason why it's challenging to assemble vertebrates and in particular humans is um, the repetitions and such repetitions occur predominantly in centromeres and center of chromosomes. I like this visualization from David Eccles where he plotted um, a bit of a centromere from chromosome X. So you can read this diagram from bottom to top and he, he made the he made the width of the diagram so that it aligns with, with the repeat length. And you can see each base is different, sorry, each color is a different base, and there are a lot of repetitions. And it makes sense that if you only have short reads, this is like a 400k repeat region of the central mare, then only short reads will never be able to solve that. And it's a, it's a miracle that long, ultra long nanopore reads were able to actually span uh, these central mares. There is another difficulty which I didn't mention so far is the fact that human genome is deployed and many mammalians are deployed as well. And usually assembly algorithms really didn't care about that and they settled for producing a consensus, meaning that if you had two haplotypes, which is a two example on top, then the assembler would produce a chimeric version of both, which is structurally correct, but the SNPs are not phased, meaning that you might get an arbitrarily allele um, at each position. So it doesn't really reflect a single haplotype or a single chromosome. There are recent works, I mentioned also a few later, that um, attempt to separate haplotypes at the chromosome scale, uh, at the chromosome level, 
but they, they require uh, special data. And I think this is really the early days of haplotype separation. In general, one, one takeaway is that producing a genome assembly software is a hugely complex task. It re generally requires either somebody to perform a whole PhD on it or have a dedicated team of engineers that work for a good amount of one or two years or even more. For fun, I tried to plot um, dependencies between source code, source code files for a single assembler. I think this one was Gossamer. Uh, but a very famous one, but you can see that it's really a mess, even at the source code level, not even digging inside the content of each file. But imagine um, having to have a global vision of how an assembler works. This is really something that only a handful of people in the world have at, at, a, at the finest level. Mainly because also assemblers have lots of heuristics. I like this quote from, from Sante Gnere, who was the developer from the old path assembler from uh, 10 years ago. Oh, in 2022, we can make a general picture that short trees are generally not used for genome assembly, except for one notable exception, which is high C, which are a special kind of short trees which give long distance uh, information and long distance contact information across uh, chromosome. Nowadays, there are don't, there are sorry, there are many many technologies of long reads. Oxford nanopore, a particular pack by hi fi is highly recommended for producing the base of an assembly. And CLR just means that it's a higher error rate of pack bio, but also longer read. I like this tweet from Mick Watson that summarizes the situation quite uh, succinctly. Um, there is also a renewal, a rebirth of methods that were developed originally for short reads, and they're making a comeback with long reads. With, uh, these methods are those using the brewing graphs, and they, uh, they appear in many assemblers such as Fly, uh, the MDBG, which is my own, LGA, and Verco. Uh, they start by constructing the brewing graph, and, and, and then they do other stuff, of course. But for efficiency, it, it really helps to have these graphs, and it takes advantage of the low error rate in the reads. And also, camera methods are used for assembly validation. So um, probably this would be mentioned later in this workshop. Quickly mentioning what cameras are and where they come from. So uh, you might probably know that a camera is any sequence of length k. What I find interesting about the history of these objects is that they really come from the 1940s and they come from two different fields. One is from a mathematician, called Nicolas de Bruyne, and one for, was from another mathematician, or actually computer scientist, Claude Shannon. And de Bruyne was really con considering an abstract object where he was asking what is a sequence that contains all possible chemicals and what is a short story. Shannon was really concerned with transmitting information efficiently. And actually, you could predict what is the next character or nucleotide after a certain after 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 having read a certain amount of information. Um, and there is a window associated with this amount after which you can predict a nucleotide, and that window is essentially a chemer. So the value of K and, and chemos occur in information theory and encoding and communication theory. Quite unrelated to bioinformatics, but still um, uh, still inspira inspirational. Actually, actually not so unrelated. It, it governs the fact that it's hard to compress genomes. So if you ever try to run gzip on a genome and you cannot get better than two bits per nucleotide, well, you can blame information theory uh, for being a fundamental law but no matter how, you, how long your cameras are in, in your genome for doing compression, then you can't beat certain, certain lower bars. Sorry, I, I digress. Um, the, the camera are actually highly used in assembly graphs, and in particular, the Bruin graphs. So the theory I'm presenting here concerns short reads, and you can see that the cameras are short of length free, but it applies exactly the same for long reads where long cameras are used. And I think most assemblers that will be discussed, a good amount of assemblers that will be discussed later in this workshop work uh, upon this principle. So the Brewing graph is a graph where nodes are k that appear in a reads and are exact overlaps of length k minus one. 
As an example, on the left, with just two reads, you can see that the two reads correspond to two haplotypes, and the graph has a nice bubble structure. In practice, the twin graphs look way more complex than the toy example on the left. And I'm just plotting here a graph for a bacteria, a bacterium, E. coli, with k equals 71, and, and plants being com condensed, compressed into single nodes. In humans, it's much harder to plot even a uh, compacted De Bruyne graph. So I'm not attempting this here, but you can imagine that it's way more complex due to repetitions in the genome. The maximum tool for visualizing relatively manageable De Bruyne graphs, so not human ones, but let's say chromosomes. Uh, this is Bandage, and the later iteration is Bandage NG that has been recently released. This enables you to to load the result of an assembly and inspect how contexts are organized. So this picture here doesn't reflect a genome. This is actually a metagenome. But each connected component, in principle, corresponds to a chromosome or multiple chromosomes which have been wrongly joined in the graph due to repetitions. I cannot not mention a telomere to telomere project that appeared this year. In fact, this would deserve an entire talk at, at an assembly workshop, but I'll try to summarize it in a single slide. So this is a complete sequence of a human genome article published this year, uh, actually a couple of months ago in, in science. And um, they described the assembly of the first gapless human genome, where each quantity corresponds to a, a, a single chromosome. And in particular, this assembly has so high Counting and 50 of 154 megabytes, a uh, megabases, sorry. And at this point, it makes no sense to talk about N50, and I'll mention that later. So essentially retired that metric for, for human genome assembly. One highlight, actually a few highlights for this results, is that they added 200 megabase pairs compared to the previous reference, GRCH38. And these megabase pairs occur mostly in Slomias but also uh, elsewhere in the genome, but mostly centralized. A big note is that what was assembled here wasn't a, um, a normal cell from, from an individual, but instead it was an haploid cancer cell that was um, female, so it didn't have a Y chromosome. And interestingly, in terms of technology, for producing the base assembly, they, they only used high reads with high canoe assembler, but a lot of coverage of more ultra long reads in order to cover those very long centromere repetitions. Of note, very recently there has been a second complete human genome uh, released, which hasn't been peer reviewed, but I'm giving a, a link to, I mean, I'm giving the title of the publication here. It's impressive that it's only been made by four authors, whereas the T2T paper was maybe 50 authors or something. Um, how did they do it? They sequenced also using phi and ultra long nanopore reads. And interestingly, they discarded the assembly made from ultra long reads only. And what they did was well, after having a draft level assembly using high phi reads, they scaffolded using the previously made T2T -T genome, the, the context using a, a specific method developed for, for this paper. And they also did some steps of semi-manual gap closing that I was looking at. And finally, they polished using a software I wasn't aware of, which is called Jasper. That is not the only way to produce high-quality genome assemblies. I'll mention three results which are relatively recent. Perhaps the most um, useful one for ERGA would be Verco. It's a recently made assembler from exactly the same people who released the T2T assembly. And they, uh, using that, they produced a very high quality assembly of this time, not a haploid cell line of genomes, but a diploid um, sample, which was HG002. However, to produce this high quality assembly, they really used a lot of data. So not, not only high phi and, and high C, but they also made use of very, um, let's say, harder to get sequencing data from StrandSeq and also they obtained data from, from parents, which was available. So, so using TRIO, they could phase better the assembly. 
a bit before Verco, there was another assembler called LGA, which is really a technical, uh, technological feat that enabled high quality assembly of human genomes using only HiFi. And actually, I'm not showing assembly characteristics here, but from my memory, Verco was able to reconstruct flawlessly uh, a good amount of chromosomes, something like 15. But LGA using only HiFi could still close, I believe, something like six chromosomes. So that's, that's impressive with just a, just a HiFi sample. And also before LGA, there was a HiFi assembler, um, HiFi ASM assembler, which can optionally take HiC or Twilio data to improve the assembly quality and also works with HiFi data. So these three assemblers, I would be highly surprised if there are at least one of them isn't tried within the ERG consortium, or so probably they're already using them. And they are really specific for, for large genomes, uh, human, of course, but also vertebrates. I, I have to mention something about the relevance of assembly metrics, which I believe would be discussed more in detail in, in the later sessions. So one metric for assembly that is a very famous one is N50, which is essentially a um, weighted average length of context. And another metric that was um, that is contributed also by one of the organizers of this workshop is the completeness of the assembly in terms of detection of single copy genes with the BUSCO software. So for N50, it's really questionable whether this is relevant in the T2T assembly, in high quality assemblies. And the reason why is, is illustrated in the figure on the right. If I show you two assemblies, one is uh, a perfectly made T2T human genome assembly on the left, and on the right, what I did was take the first half of the perfectly reconstructed contigs and keep them. But the second half of the assembly completely fragmented, um, mix, mix up all the contigs, don't discard them, but mix them up. And actually, in terms of N50, those two assemblies are strictly identical because the N50 only cares about half of the assembly, so the largest half. So the assembly could be perfect for 15 chromosomes, but the rest of the chromosomes can be completely messed up and 50 wouldn't care. So that makes it not an ideal metric for this situation. There are now many projects, ERG is one of them, for sequencing lots of diversity in in, in on Earth, in terms of vertebrates, but potentially other other life, and this projects have in common the fact that they would sequence as much as possible and always assemble them. But there are many challenges that need to be solved, especially in terms of repetitiveness of the species that are going to be collected, different cloides, and apparently the sample collection is potentially one of the hardest step uh, prior to to sequencing to be solved. And here I'm showing um, a diagram that I took from Delphine Larivière, who explained the VGP 2.0 pipeline. You can see that it consists of doing assembly using a nuclear assembler, it could be HiFi SM or iCanu from HiFi data, then uh, purging duplicates, which means removing some duplications that are introduced by the assembler, and finally refine the assembly using different data types, if available by a nano and high C data. And in the end, you obtain a, a scaffold. So it's quite complex. I'm assuming it takes a long time to run, but it's also highly likely to produce reliable, uh, high-quality assemblies in the end. And of course, there are also many evaluation steps at every stage of the pipeline, which would be potentially discussed later in this workshop. This might be a bit outside the scope of this workshop, but I wanted to mention two things. One is the state of bacterial genome assembly. The other one is the state of viral genome assembly. I like to study bacterial genome assembly just because it's a good litmus test. If you cannot assemble a bacterial genome well, there's no hope to assemble a bacterial isolate well. There's no hope to assemble a vertebrate genome well. And what we looked at in 2019 was uh, actually 30% of bio bacterial assemblies were fragmented. With my PhD student, Pierre-Marie Jean, we looked more specifically why. And we noticed that in assembly graphs, such as the one shown on the right, often assemblers made good contexts, pretty long ones, but sometimes they were confused by just one repetition or they were confused by, uh, by a tandem repeat or sometimes they just fragmented arbitrarily a, a genome. 
where there was apparently no reason to by maybe discarding too many reads. So the, the lesson from this investigation is that it's possible to actually investigate high quality assemblies and maybe push the quality a little bit further if you look at assembly graphs, going back to the, to the raw reads and aligning them to the assembly graph. In terms of viral assembly, now this is, I guess, a way off topic for, for this workshop. I just mentioned recent work that we did with collaborators where we performed um, a very large scale assembly. We took five, all existing 5 million RNA seq data that was available at uh, S, uh, NCBI SRA that consists of 10 petabases of data. That's about. And we collected some data sets, 50,000 of them. That were likely to contain coronavirus genomes. And using uh, Amazon Web Services architecture on a cloud, with lots of CPUs and not so much time, we were able to assemble these 50,000 data sets. And within these data sets, we were able to discover new coronavirus species. And at the same time, also um, expanded the number of known RNA viral species by 10 times. So by performing these assemblies, I noticed that it remained quite challenging to assemble viruses from metagenomes, despite the fact that viruses are really, really, really small. There are 20 kb, 30 kb in length, up to hundreds of kb. That's nothing. In principle, context should contain full viruses. But due to various factors, such as low coverage, repetitions with, um, with other genomes in a metagenome, and also strain variation, which is analogous to ploidy in invertebrates then, an assembly isn't solved for, for, for viruses. Closing the parenthesis, and I will end with this uh, particular topic, I'll mention some of my recent work with colleagues, Paris Shakim and Bonnie Berger at MIT, where we developed uh, MDVG, so minimize the space to print graphs. This is a technique that takes as input packed by your high fire rate, so low error rate, it has to be low error rate. And when you have this data, it's possible to construct an assembly for human genome or invertebrate genome highly efficiently in 10 minutes or 10 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, that's, that's particularly fast, and I'll mention later some results. But if you also perform pan genomics across humans or bacteria, bacterial species, here you can see a bacterial a pan genome graph of many bacterial species or an exertoid. And this paper was published last year at, at Recombin Cell Systems. And I will quickly mention the trick because I think there is some value in producing highly quickly a draft level assembly. And the trick here is not to consider k-mers or even to consider overlap graphs, but instead to change the alphabet. Instead of looking at bases, we look at optimizers inside, inside reads, which essentially discards 99% of the data or 99.9% .9 of the data until the very last step of assembly where those bases are re-injected back but the intermediate steps are done quick, which enables very fast assembly. In more details, the principle of NDBG is to take reads from here on top, extract minimizers from these reads, which correspond to only certain positions. So here I'm showing M2, M3, M2, M4, M2, which has a succession of minimizers across all the reads, and then construct cameras uh, over the alphabet of those minimizers. Once you do that, you obtain a De Bruyne graph, classic, um, without, without any change to the definition except to the alphabet. And finally, once you constructed this graph, the classic um, assembly simplification steps apply. And if you follow this diagram from left to right, <coughs> the process consists of transforming reads, constructing the graph, and simplifying to, to obtain long and unambiguous paths and finally convert these paths back, back into base space. And when you do that, you obtain assemblies very quickly, uh, particularly compared to other, other software. So if we look at whole human packed by your hi-fi data, if we compare to the state of the art at the time, which was Peregrine and hi-fi ASM, which took um, days to, to complete with hundreds of gigabytes of, of memory, and they obtain certain assembly draft quality, and with, with Rust and DBG, we did that in 10 minutes and 10 gigabytes of RAM and obtained the draft level quality. So this is nowhere near T2T, but comparable to what you would be able to obtain with software that takes longer to run. 
I'll, I'll conclude here. So click your wait. I guess our genome assembly nowadays is mostly done with long reads. It's, of course, one of the two fundamental sequence bioinformatics problem, along with sequence alignment. Um, it's important to realize that algorithms and data structures play a huge role in the development of methods. And uh, behind the scenes, there's large amounts of Python, C++, Rust for creating tools which are highly complex and yet uh, generally perform not so badly. A major open problem in the field is to produce a method that would produce let's say gapless or near gapless assembly from single sample long reads. So far, we, we have LGA, HiFi, ASM, which approach this goal, but there are still many caveats and, and, and the field hasn't produced a robust uh, genome assembler yet. There's way more improve, improvement that can be, I suppose, squeezed from the data. So um, <laughs> just acknowledge my team at Institute Pasteur, uh, some of them are actually here in the audience. And uh, I'll finish by, um, I can't resist giving this whenever I talk about the Bruin graphs. I hope you find it as inspirational as I do. And that is my last slide. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Ryan, for the very inspiring talk. I'm really happy that you were here with us. And I invite all participants to please post your questions uh, in the discussion forum. I think Ryan will be happy to, to answer to any question. I start with the question by Anne. Um, I wonder, wondering uh, whether MDBG compress homopolymers Right. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, and so, yes, we actually, like many other assemblers, we do homopolymer compression. I should probably have mentioned this, although it's a technical detail. Um, any repeat sequence of nucleotides, so AAAA, CCCC, and so on, become compressed into a single occurrence of these nucleotides. And that happens even before you construct a graph. What assemblers do in the end is that they uncompress and actually restore number of nucleotides. People do this not just for fun, but actually because this removes one of the major error modes of, of bacterial data and nanopore data. When the estimation of the number of repetitions of a uh, single nucleotide is not very well made. I hear there is also errors when not only you have repetition of a single nucleotide, but three, three different nucleotides which are tandem repeats. <clears throat> so this I don't do in MDBG, but but only homopolymer compression is, is done, I believe, in most of the genome assemblers, such as I can do, um, LGA and MDBG, and actually Verco. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a second question from Joanna. Can you please mention more about the uh, PacBio CLR, if possible? Sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you would like me to mention, whether it's a chemistry or what the data looks like. I would assume the, the latter. Mm -hmm. So, because actually I cannot really answer about the former. Um, <laughs> so the CLR data is, is essentially the backbone that enables the production of hi-fi data. What I mean by that is that um, reads are passed into, uh, into the waveguide of the sequencer and the polymerase enables the determination of, of phases one by one. And you have a certain length of sequence elucidated per molecule. And HiFi consists of actually sequencing not uh, a linear molecule, but a circular one. So reading the same section multiple times, which enables the R correction. CLR is essentially the predecessor of that, where you could sequence the whole linear molecule and not worry about any type of error correction because it's not circular. So apart from the usual uh, attempt to correct errors that are due to uh, wrong luminescence, then CLR data is generally longer than HiFi, but also more error prone. So at the time it was, I believe, around 10% error rate with, with co components corresponding to insertions, substitutions, and deletions. 
I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure today what is the heroics of CLR because I see mostly HiFi data being produced, but potentially there's value in producing CLR data if you want to span uh, repetitions that are longer than those spanned by HiFi, where the reads are typically 10 or 20, um, 10 to 20 KB length. CLR being five to six times longer. Okay. And and also asks whether you have experience with ONT duplex reads. That's a good question, and that's a recent data type from ONT for which I have not so much experience. I'm happy to to give the floor to somebody who comment uh, exactly what ONT duplex consists of. I suspect it's similar in spirit to reading twice the same molecule to lower the error rate, but uh, actually maybe because you read the forward and the reverse trend at the same time, but I don't want to say something wrong. Uh, I think that I can comment about it. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, so what you say is uh, indeed it's basically uh, sequencing the same sequence twice. Uh, but um, uh, so then indeed the uh, error rate uh, is uh, is reduced and uh, we have generated some uh, some uh, uh, some reads uh, with uh, the art and flow cells recently, and uh, the error rate was uh, around 3%, I think, which is still not like high fi but um, then the, assembly, the assemblies were very good and uh, huge completeness, and we could even make camera plots with it. So it's quite an improvement. Great to know, thanks. So that's, that's pretty recent, right? So, I invite exactly. so, are there any more questions from the participants? There are some in the live q and A. I'm not sure if I should take them online or offline. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I'm just trying to read the first one. OK. But the second in human genome you mentioned, don't you consider it cheating or error prone using a pre existing? I'm not able to scroll down if you manage to do it, please. I can see the whole question. So, the question is do you consider it cheating or error prone using an existing assembly to scaffold a new assembly? It's, it's a highly legitimate question. Um, I can preface the answer by quoting Gene Myers. He was speaking last week. In, in Berlin, and he mentioned that, in fact, any attempt at assembling a human genome after the first draft is considered to be resequencing. Like, we do assembly de novo, but in fact, we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot by not using existing human genomes that were previously assembled for good and bad reasons. We could use them because they inform on, let's say, we could have uh, higher quality assembly if we used existing human genomes to scaffold an assembly. Could also make mistakes if we somehow scaffolding between two contexts, but in fact, in the sample that you sequence, it's not the right adjacency. There has been some structural variation between between the two contexts. So to answer your question, it it's I would say it's probably not cheating, cheating, but it would be very much worth it to check that the scaffolding that it did results in a structurally correct assembly of their sample. If that is the case, then I would say method is sound. If that is not the case, then there are potentially problems with the method. I'm assuming the round of the review will, will hopefully um, shed light on this question. OK, thank you. So we have also a second question by Ioannis. How would you choose the right assembler for a non-model organism? Can you think of cases where you where HiFi SM wouldn't work? Right. Um, that's an excellent question, and I believe it's at the heart of ERGA preoccupation. Um, so there has been assembly benchmarks, but today, in particular with long reads, HiFi reads, there are not so many of them which are up to date. So you cannot really rely on benchmarks such as assembler on two to draw any conclusion on the state of ex existing assemblers. So the best way would be to read, let's say, 
year and last year, recent uh, assembly papers from, let's say, LGA, Verco, Hi-Fi, SM, to get an idea of uh, how they perform on the various experiments they did. Um, it, of course, it, sometimes it's only human and maybe another organism. Um, then, actually, your question can be answered later in this workshop because this will be the topic of assembly evaluation. For the, for the second part of your question, where Hi-Fi ASM wouldn't work, there is really care to be taken by looking at, by, but, sorry, by looking at false duplications, and especially that's where Busco is helpful, because sometimes Hi-Fi ASM, um, when you ask it to produce a consensus, so it's, there's multiple output by Hi-Fi ASM. One is a phase assembly, or almost phase assembly, and another is a consensus. There are names for that, but I, I, I forgot how they named. But sometimes a hi-fi is duplicate a region, thinking that it's um, two different instances of the repeat, but in fact those two instances are at the same lo locus in the genome, and they are just two haplotypes. So that's really a case that that we've seen that occurs with hi-fi ESM. Um, but then it, we can say that it really doesn't work. It just works, but produces a um, an output that has mistakes. Okay, thank you. Um, another question by Ferran Palero. Are you aware of any current efforts to produce uh, de novo assemblies from population samples of small organisms? I guess when organisms are so small that you get a little amount of DNA. And what do you think about whole genome amplification? Ah, um, so myself, I'm not really aware of efforts to produce assemblies from population of samples. I'm guessing this is something that is being done in, in ecological fields. Uh, maybe someone else in the audience could comment on this. For the second part of, of your question about whole genome amplification, I'm also not a specialist on it. My only impression is that it's a flawed uh, mechanism that produces significant coverage biases and which results in fragmented assemblies. So that's essentially in the case of single cell, for instance, it's hard, it's nearly impossible to produce contiguous assemblies from single cell samples. I'm happy to comments from, from the audience about this question or from the organizers. Okay. Anybody's invited, of course, to participate in the discussion if they want. And just to go back to the um, to the forum to see if we have other questions. Um, I can't see any. So I have just one question for you. Uh, so what would be your dream as a computational biologist about the sequences that you would, would love to assemble? I mean, do you think the technique, uh, like now we have long reads, we have, we used to have only small reads. What would be the next step to make your life easier? Apart from having a sequence of which goes from telomere to telomere, of course, which is um, feasible. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. It's an inspirational one. Um, I guess to me, the dream would have to have longer sequences, not necessarily telomere to telomere reads, but spanning longer repetitions, not necessarily entire centromeres, although entire centromeres would be quite helpful in, in the human case, and I suspect in many vertebrates as well. Um, if you ask Jim Myers, he would answer to you that it's sufficient to have 15 kV reads at 19 or, oh, sorry, 99 or 98 something error rate. And he has a good reason for that, although he never develops it in his talk. That's an unfortunate problem. <laughs> so somebody would have to ask him uh, specifically. So my my evil plan would be to use NDBG with longer reads, and I suspect it would produce higher quality assemblies potentially to the telomere. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so there is a question also from Robert. Robert would like to to ask something? Yeah, so maybe as we're, as we're kind of wrapping up this session, um, back in the day, comparing um, 
different softwares. Uh, we have things like assemblers, assemblathons, and I mean, in other fields, uh, different kinds of competitions, if you like, or structured competitions. Do you think that like now with the, the speed of algorithm development, the open sourceness of stuff, the pre-printing of stuff, that there is no longer a place for such kind of community competitions or self-evaluation? Or do you think it's something that we actually need to, to try to do again at some point? That's a, that's a question. So I would say it's, there's definitely a space for having such, a, such an event. The challenge is often not where you expect it is. Your challenge would be org organizational. So which, who, which team would be willing to take on the challenge of setting up sequencing of another organism, such as the, the challenge that biased, doing the evaluation, writing up the paper. Takes, in my experience, it takes a lot of efforts to, to run such a benchmarking event. Maybe you've participated in or organized some of them. So another challenge would be to decide on what is the data type to evaluate methods on because it's a moving target, right? So high file reads are getting longer. Nanopore reads error rate is, seems to be dropping and ultra long is actually, I would be curious to hear from the audience what, how easy it is for you guys to obtain ultra long nanopore reads. My impression is that it's hard on an experimental level, but maybe it's not. So then- um, I was agreeing with you, it's hard, yes. <laughs> All right, so but, but so methods nowadays seem to be assuming, at least for human genomes, but can get ultra long reads. I'm questioning this assumption uh, every time I review a bit for, for these assemblers. Um, so yeah, so a benchmark I'm assuming would consist of high reads of a certain length for a certain organism that nobody can cheat on by taking a previous assembly. Um, and it would be highly timely, especially in the, in the time of uh, ERGA, DGP and DTOR and all of these consortiums, which really are attempting to use or reproduce such results from a benchmark on their own. So it would, I'm assuming it would help you guys to have this, this event or the community in general, and also software developers. Yeah. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. It is a big challenge, and I guess that's why no one is brave enough to take it on. But, uh... <laughs> To be the case. As you say, things are moving so fast that uh, does such an ex exercise even make sense today? But it's still good really? to compare. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your attention. So thank you again. We are right on time, so to move to the next session. So I hand over to Joanna, the chairing of the next session, and I see you later. Please do ask as many questions as you wish, because we are all ready to answer to them. So, Joanna. So, our next session is on assembly post processing, with our first speaker being Nadej uh, Guilielmoni. Uh, she is a postdoc researcher at the University of Cologne, and her work is focused on genomic assemblies of non-model vertebrate animals uh, using long reads and high C. Uh, she is also a co-coordinator of sequencing and she is a co-coordinator of the sequencing and assembly committee of ERGA. So welcome Nadesh, uh, please take it away. Hello everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, collapsing haplotypes in long read assemblies of uh, eukaryote genomes. And uh, I noticed that some uh, uh, the, the, there were some discussion about uh, uh, duplicated, uh, artifactually uh, duplicated uh, uh, haplotypes uh, in uh, in assemblies. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So uh, when uh, we assemble genomes, uh, so we have a haploid genomes where uh, every chromosome is in, is in only one version. And then there are other uh, 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 genomes for which we have sets of chromosomes. Uh, for instance, in diploid genomes, we have uh, pairs of homologous chromosomes that are very similar to each other. And then uh, in polyploid species, there will be uh, there could be uh, sets of uh, three homologous chromosomes or even four homologous chromosomes and even more. 
And uh, so here in, we have an example of a diploid genome uh, with the two haplotypes. And uh, between these two haplotypes, there will be some homozygous regions where uh, there are no differences between the two haplotypes. And then there will be some low heterozygosity regions uh, with, for instance, here only one SNP. And uh, then there are high heterozygosity regions that are very different between the two haplotypes. And that's where it gets fun. So here, when we try to assemble this diploid genome, uh, so it's really easy to, gener to uh, generate one sequence for homozygous regions uh, because there is only one possibility. But then uh, for heterozygous regions, there are several possibilities. And so uh, homozygous regions can uh, be reconnected to the different versions of heterozygous regions, which creates uh, bubbles in uh, assembly graphs. So what we can do first uh, is to generate a haploid assembly in which every uh, homologous chromosomes are represented by only one sequence. So in this case, homozygous regions are represented in only one copy. And uh, for heterozygous regions, uh, we can select uh, one version or the other. Another possibility is to phase the assembly. So in this case, we're going to represent both haplotypes. So homozygous regions will be in uh, two versions here for a diploid genome, uh, in two copies. And uh, for the heterozygous regions, all versions are represented. But what we often get is this problematic assembly uh, because uh, often assemblers try to collapse haplotypes and uh, they will do it well for homozygous regions that are here represented in only one copy, but they will fail for uh, more divergent heterozygous regions. And uh, since both uh, versions of the region have the same support from sequencing data, they will not be able to choose between the two and will just be like, okay, let's put the two. But then the problem here is that since we want only one sequence for uh, homologous chromosomes, this leads to an artifactual duplication because this single region is represented twice in the assembly. So I wanted to investigate how I could uh, improve on this problem uh, using low accuracy long reads. Uh, and I had uh, PacBio CLR reads and nanopore reads uh, at high coverage from a little animal, which is called Adineta vaga. Uh, it's a microscopic animal and uh, a very convenient pet that you can put in your freezer if you want. And uh, so I tried for this genome to th seven different assemblers. Uh, well, you may know these names, Canu, Flea, Nexenovo, Ra, Raven, Shasta, and WTDBG2. And uh, the first thing that I noticed when I looked at the assemblies is that uh, the assemblies were oversized compared to the haploid genome size that I was expecting, 102 megabases. And uh, so this is a first, uh, the first clue that you may have artifactual duplications because these duplications will lead to an increased assembly size. So what I did is that I, I tried uh, filtering the read prior to assembly uh, you, based on length or uh, with felt long using length and quality. And then I tried uh, purging the haplotics using uh, different tools. And with that, I defined uh, several strategies that uh, worked pretty well to obtain uh, properly collapsed uh, assemblies. Uh, and so I won't go more into detail about these results for today. You can check out uh, the, all the analyses, uh, the numerous analyses and numerous results that I got in this little paper. But for now, I want to talk about what can be done with uh, high accuracy long reads, uh, namely high fair reads here. 
So it just happened that last week we had an Nimble course uh, where uh, to, to teach people how to do a genome assembly, uh, which was organized by a group of uh, ERGAM members. And I thought that it was a very good time to test uh, haplotic purging of hi-fi assemblies since, well, we needed, I needed to teach the students how to do uh, hi-fi assembly, uh, how to do haplotic purging. So what we did is that we tried, uh, we assembled reads, hi-fi reads here, still for my little Adinita Vaga, and still at high coverage. Uh, we assembled it with Flea, High Canu, High Fiasm, Next De Novo, Raven, and WTBG2. Sorry, I don't have all the assemblers yet. Uh, as Ren said, everything is uh, outdated for uh, high fi assemblers because uh, because it's moving so fast. <laughs> so, um, and then I tried to purge these assemblies uh, with purge jobs. And so for the initial assemblies, one thing that was striking is that uh, the first three assemblies are at least 200, well, close or even more than uh, 200 megabases, which is rather the expected deep fluid genome size. So these assemblies seem rather to be phased than collapsed. And the ne next three assemblies are now closer to the assembly size of uh, 100 uh, of the haploid assembly size that we were expecting of 102 megabases, but still a bit larger than what it should be here. And uh, the WTDBG2 assembly is uh, the one that is the closest to the assembly size that we're expecting. So here uh, I looked at uh, the Busco orthologs, which are a set of orthologs that we would expect to find in the genome. You will hear more in detail about it later. And you can see that uh, in green, you have the uh, Busco orthologs in one copy and in pink, the ones that are uh, duplicated. And for the first three assemblies, they are mostly with, the, the Busco orthologs are mostly duplicated while for the other assemblies, uh, the, it's mostly single copy orthologs. And here you have a chemer plot of uh, the WTDBG2 assembly, which seemed to be the most collapsed assembly from uh, this first test. And so you have a, so now you know about chemer, which are key length sequences that we search for in the assembly. Uh, you have the number of distinct chemers and their multiplicity in the assembly. And then the colors indicate how many times they are represented in the assembly. And here, so here we have basically erroneous chemers that we don't want to have in our assembly. So it's black, it's good for zero representation. And then we have two peaks, the first peak being for heterozygous chemers. Uh, and the second peak for homozygous chemers that are twice as that they are twice more represented in the assembly than the heterozygous chemers. And for a collapse assembly, we need to have all the homozygous chemer in only one copy. Uh, while for the heterozygous chemers, we can only represent one version of each heterozygous region. So part of them are missing and part of them are in one copy. So here you can check that the assembly seems to be pretty well collapsed. And here, this is the flea assembly, which looks much more like a, a phased assembly because here the homozygous regions are in two copies and the heterozygous regions are in one copy because every haplotype is represented. So, um, oops, sorry. Uh, so here uh, we have the assemblies uh, before and after haplotic purging. And what is striking is that now all the assemblies are very close to the assembly size that we were, that we were uh, expecting and uh, absolutely terrific uh, contiguity, even though, as you know, it's not the only thing to look at. Uh, and now if we look at the Busco score, uh, all the assembly have uh, roughly the same number of a single copy orthologs and uh, uh, much less um, duplicated orthologs. And now also one thing that was 
uh, very surprising for me is that uh, we had this schema plot here uh, with the high canoe assembly, which seemed completely insane with uh, some uh, chemers represented six times, which is what? Uh, and then after haplotic purging, uh, this has been greatly improved. And uh, um, so, and even this is a bit better than the first assembly that we saw with WTDBD2, because the one from WTDBD2 had some missing chemers here than the, that the canoe assembly doesn't have. So what we should uh, remember from this uh, is that, well, always, always, always check for uncollapsed haplotypes uh, when you do um, uh, assemblies of uh, diploid or polyploid genomes, uh, because uh, having artifactual uh, duplications uh, will come completely, uh, we, will be very bad for your downstream analysis. Uh, also, chemo plots are your friend, look at them thoroughly, uh, use them, uh, abuse them uh, to, to, to really check whether you have artifactual duplications or not. And also, <laughs> I think that the main lesson uh, is that uh, hi-fi assemblies have really made a drastic um, um, have really brought a drastic progress in terms of what we can do uh, for haplotic purging. Uh, because, I mean, in the assemblies that I showed you, uh, the, all, in the end, all of them were properly collapsed uh, while I run so many assemblies uh, with low accuracy long reads. And the results were not as convincing and it took so much more effort. So now as we can get properly collapsed assemblies with all of these assemblers, then it means that, okay, we don't have, I mean, we, we, we can reach well collapsed assemblies. We don't have to choose them just based on that. Uh, we can uh, raise a bar on our expectations of what would be the best assembly. So thank you for your attention, and I will now leave the floor for scaffolding. Hello, everyone. First, uh, I would like to apologize for only be able, being able to uh, record this instead of presenting it live. But as it happens, I will be at another conference as uh, you are hearing this presentation. So this will have to be recorded. Second, I would like to thank the organizers to bear with me, even though I could not uh, attend live and let me present my work, uh, even uh, as a recorded presentation. So I um, let me present myself. I am uh, Liam Baudry. I am a postdoc at University of Lausanne. I did my PhD at Institut Pasteur and during my PhD work, I worked uh, among other things on high C based chromosome scale uh, scaffolding and uh, I will present a brief overview of a program I uh, helped make called Instagram. So as you probably know, uh, we are uh, in the midst of uh, an explosion in uh, genome projects. So the first generation was using very uh, low, low coverage sequencing data and uh, was much more expensive. The second generation saw the advent of the viral sequencing, which re really helped boost the um, the rise of uh, genome projects and uh, uh, high throughput uh, sequencing. And uh, now, as we speak, there are a host of uh, large, very large scale projects attempting to uh, assemble pretty much every single genome of every single species on Earth. And uh, this is just an overview. And uh, my work is uh, was part of this uh, trend to uh, to perform large scale reassembly on a variety of species. So you probably know the problem in many species. The reference genome is not known or fragmented because of a lack of uh, sequencing depth or uh, just a lack of um, of money to perform this very expensive sequencing. So you have the actual chromosome, the available information, which is fragmented. And the solution is to integrate this data, this legacy data, with new technologies that have arisen from this decade and the last. And uh, so you probably know the these technologies, so long read sequencing, 10x, <clears throat> and high C. So high C will be the focus of uh, this presentation. 
So the high C explodes this so-called 3D information, the chromosome organization, in order to reconstruct the 1D information that is the relative order of the sequences, aka the complete chromosome. So in order to understand high C, we need to make a jump in time uh, about 20 years. So uh, actually more than 20 years, in 2001, Karsten Ripper comes up with a model in order to predict intrachromosomal contacts using a very uh, well-established uh, knowledge from hydrostatics. <clears throat> and in this model, DNA is uh, represented as a chain of three jointed monomers. And the contact probability uh, between two monomers is uh, represented as a function of the distance that separates uh, these monomers, so this, uh, this formula here. In practice, we'll only see uh, the right-hand part uh, of, the, of the peak. And in order to uh, jump from this idealized representation of DNA to an actual uh, model that you can use in biology, you need to um, sort of uh, do an equivalence between concepts. So the ideal, ideal polymer chain becomes a chromatin. The Kuhn length, which is a property of uh, the rigidity of the material, becomes a genomic distance. And instead of having the local concentration, we have the so-called collision frequency, also an MPDS which will uh, come up a lot in the in this talk, which, which is the probability of contact between two loci separated by the genomic distance S. Now, in order to quantify this, uh, this PDS, we need to jump forward to two, uh, two years later. So in 2002, uh, with uh, this uh, protocol uh, invented by uh, Job Decker and his lab called chromosome confirmation capture. And uh, in this protocol, uh, they really attempt to quantify these interactions. So how does it work? You need to cross-link the DNA with the protein complex surrounding it, with a very short and reactive material, uh, a molecule called formaldehyde. Uh, this will bind the DNA and the protein complex surrounding it. And then you digest the DNA with a restriction enzyme and ligate it. The principle is that molecules that are close to each other in space will be uh, trapped uh, next to each other within the protein complex and be uh, ligated together. And the set of all such uh, DNA uh, hybrid, hybrid, hybrids will form a so-called 3C library. And once you uh, sequence in parent this 3C library, you end up with a different set of uh, uh, sequence pairs with different frequencies. And the set of all such pairs on their respective frequencies form the so-called contact maps. Contact map. So this is a, a pairwise uh, contact frequency between all uh, sequence pairs. And I will show you an example in order to make you really familiar with uh, how this uh, technology works. So let's see with uh, vibro -coriolase. So which it is a bacterium with uh, two chromosomes. Imagine uh, you have uh, two two different uh, kind of contacts were on frequency. So two chromosomes, chromosome one, chromosome two. The first thing we see is that there are two sort of squares because uh, intrachromosomal contacts are more frequent than interchromosomal contacts. So this is very neat on the contact map. You can really see the borders between the, the two chromosomes. The second thing we see is uh, the so-called so PDS, which is very visible. So uh, here is uh, an example of a short range contact, which is more red, more dark, more darker than uh, light, uh, the lighter pixel that represent large cell contacts. So of course, if you are close to each other in 1D, you will be close to each other in 3D and vice versa. Uh, not only that, but the, there is a sort of uh, decrease as you get uh, further away from the diagonal. And this is the case for both chromosomes. The third thing we see are the little smudges at the corners. They simply represent the fact that both chromosomes are circular. So really, when you, you have to look, you have to consider that all corners are, in fact, the same locus. So as you can see, there are a host of different features that you can see on a contact map. And uh, so um, the really crucial thing to, uh, to understand is that there really is a one-to-one -one relationship between contact frequency and genomic distance between 1D and 3D. If you have one, in theory, you can get the other. That's really uh, what uh, high C uh, assembly uh, relies on. So in this context, high C based reassembly is a matter of solving the puzzle. So you have all these little smudges that don't really fit 
what I exposed about uh, our ideas, what a contact map should look like. And high based reassembly is really performing all inversion swaps, insertions in order to solve this problem. So this is an example I did by hand with the unknown bacterium, but you can already see the misassemblies. So first thing first, you need to uh, swap three and four. Then you need to, um, uh, then you need to invert three, and then you need to do a permutation. And you can see that uh, this uh, the last contact map is looks looks much more like a normal uh, contact map, and you can see that the genome is much more likely to be correctly reassembled. Now, if uh, I can do it by hand, I can ask a computer to do it uh, for us. And this is what Instagram uh, is uh, is all about. So Instagram is a continuation of a program called Graal, which was published in 2014. There are differences, uh, mostly coming uh, mostly that come down to the polishing aspects. But uh, I will leave that part to the other speakers, and I will mostly focus here on the on the MCMC, the scaffolding part, so to speak. So in this uh, in this program the pds is uh, reduced to uh, a more a simpler uh, simpler model with a prefactor and an exponent that represents the, the power law decrease in order to account for interchromosomal contact we need to add a third parameter that represents the residual contacts because we need to account for the fact that intrachromosomal contacts are in theory always superior to interchromosomal contacts so this model is simplified there are we know uh, based on the understanding of uh, of dna uh, uh, biophysics that uh, there are more parameters, but for the purpose of reassembly, it's more than enough to, uh, to to perform the scaffolding. And how does it work? So we initialize a set of bins from restriction fragments. We initialize the parameters. For each bin, we cycle through them. We sample neighboring bins and uh, perform operations. So inversion transpositions, as uh, we say, uh, we, I talked about. And then we assess the modified genomes. Uh, and uh, so uh, basically we select the more uh, the more likely the one that corresponds to the highest likelihood shift and then we update uh, the parameters accordingly and uh, the genome accordingly as well so both are updated in tandem and eventually they converge and the genome is scaffolded and then uh, i validated uh, this uh, this approach with uh, uh, an alga, an alga species whose genome was either too uh, unassembled, so it's more, it's um, uh, more than a few hundred um, megabase in size. It's used as a model for uh, many evo uh, studies, and they obtained twenty eight pseudo chromosomes with a genetic map. And the goal was to see whether this was consistent with the IC. This was what, this was a collaboration with Susan Aquilo's lab, and the paper is now published. So uh, here are the data sets. So as you know, genome assembly is mostly plumbing. Uh, you uh, need to integrate all kinds of different data and uh, sort of fit it together in order to get the best metrics. And I see just one part of this. So this is just to give you uh, an overview of the project, but I see was only one brick of the, of the genome assembly pipeline. And uh, of course, I'm not showing the validation part, but, but uh, of course, uh, this was validated with uh, the usual metrics of uh, Using compar a comparative analysis, but what I want you, what I want to show you, is the the movie where you can really see the how the the program actually works. So, on the left hand side is the matrix, the con uh, and on the right hand side is the corresponding uh, scaffolding, and you can see it will try many combinations, and eventually, you will see a sort of structure with squares uh, arising. So the the they are not very visible, but they will eventually be more visible. So really, the you have to look at the white smudges that will eventually form half squares. And uh, once you have only a handful of them, actually uh, 27, if you, uh, you will know that uh, the, the, the assembly will have converged to a chromosome scale structure. So this is now visible. So there are always a few uh, bits left, but that's part of the process and the polishing. and. Uh, when you look at the contact map, you can see that it's actually after a few cycles, most of the genome converges to a few scaffolds, and the rest is uh, mostly uh, intrachromosomal polishing. So you can see that the chromosome scale scaffolding is very efficient and quick, and most of the the bulk of the remaining uh, work is about the the, the polishing and the few uh, uh, bits uh, of inaccuracies left uh, within the chromosomes. 
So this is before and after to give you an overview. And interestingly, we found only 27 scaffolds, which uh, has to be contrasted with the 28 pseudochromosomes on the genetic map. So it means that the high C could capture a fusion event that was not captured by the genetic map. So as a summary, uh, I hope I convinced you that high C based method uh, have a lot of promise for genome reassembly. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I, uh, I used it uh, for uh, the high quality ectocarpus uh, scaffolding, which was uh, published in a paper in uh, genome biology. And uh, of course, so this is, as I said, this is only one brick of uh, the of a full-fledged assembly pipeline, which uh, of obviously uh, means that in order to uh, develop this kind of technology, we have to integrate uh, it with other sources of uh, and types of data, and uh, this will be the subject of further uh, assembly genome assembly work. So uh, thank you for attention, and uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Our final speaker for this session is Anne McCartney. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Health in the US. Uh, she is in charge of a pilot, and she is also involved in the Earth Biogenome Project. And she has um, publishing of the human genome. So, here we are. Hi, um, can you, I just want to confirm that you can see my screen. Oh, perfect. Okay, um, thank you so much for the invitation to present today and to talk about our work on the completion of the first team in genome um, as part of the Telomere, Telomere Consortium. My name is Anne McCartney and I am a member of Dr. Adam Filippi's group in the genome informatics section in the NHGRI. So the work I'll present today is uh, largely, is not just my own work. Um, it was a huge collaborative effort by a polishing team that we, an international polishing team. And so I just want to keep that in mind as I'm going through the presentation, just to give everybody fair attribution to their contributions to this wonderful effort. Um, so just starting off with the Sergey's work, uh, uh, well, predominantly the Sergey's work and the, the actual first CHM13 complete sequence. So they issued their first draft sequence. And uh, as Ryan actually already mentioned, this was based off a, um, a haptotidiform mole. Um, so it, this means that it's nearly uniform. This, um, the genome of this um, cell line actually is almost uniformly homozygous and it is has the XX karyotype which made it a good candidate for being the first, um, an easier candidate to start with for generating a first complete T to T human assembly. So the sequence, the, the assembly, the draft assembly itself, I'm highlighting here on the left-hand side of the screen, was built predominantly or primarily of, of hi-fi reads, but we did have to supplement it and patch it with ONT reads um, due to the GA dropouts that actually occur in hi-fi reads. Um, the initial draft assembly sequence had a, an error in about every 10.5 megabases, but it was a fairly good um, starting point for an initial genome assembly. And so I think the QV at this point was about 70.22. Um, so having a starting point that was such high quality, we needed to ensure that any polishing that we were doing afterwards was not introducing any additional harms to this really highly accurate sequence. And so we employed a do no harm approach. And so why would we even bother polishing a highly accurate genome like this in the first place? Well, we wanted to ensure that the, uh, the accuracy of the assembly, it, particularly in large repeats, and in, to ensure that there was no overcorrection. Um, we wanted to mitigate technology-specific sequencing errors that usually lead to distinct assembly errors. And we wanted to ensure that suboptimal assembly of specific loci does not lead to small and large errors in the draft assembly. Why did we use a do no harm approach specifically was because a lot of traditional polishing approaches actually um, 
using alignment-based validation and polishing methods usually underperform within genomic repeats where alignments are usually ambiguous and inaccurate. So the inaccurate, the ambiguous alignments here cause errors, um, things to be polished and introduced um, errors where there shouldn't be. And obviously this we wanted to avoid um, introducing additional error into a very highly accurate genome. So again, I just want to acknowledge all of my T2T polishing team co uh, collaborators, particularly my co-leads on the team, which were, were um, Kishwar Shafin and Michael Alange. And we were really led by, um, under the leadership of uh, predominantly Arang Ri for this work. And so we decided that the traditional tools that were available for, available for polishing would probably overcorrect um, a genome of this accuracy and that we needed a, a do no harm approach and this, we needed to, to develop this as a team. So I won't go into the specifics here, but the main goal of our polishing strategy was to be robust to repeats and technology specific biases. So I'll take you through this strategy step by step. The first thing that we had to do was do a thorough evaluation of Sergey Nurk's initial string graph. To do this, we started with uh, wanting to understand what is the QV score for this, um, this initial string graph. When we estimated the QV score using HiFi and Illumina, um, we found that it was actually underestimating the QV of this assembly. Um, how we found this out was through when we looked at the assemblies that were present um, in the assembly, we calculated the KMERS that were present in the assembly, but not in the reads using the HiFi. Um, this is using the HiFi read data set. And we found that these um, error KMERS were pre predominantly, probably unsurprisingly, in the regions that were patched use, using ONT. Um, and, and these also correlated with the GA dropout region. So unsurprising there. When we did the same analysis using the Illumina KMERS, we found that um, the KMERS that were present in the assembly and missing from the Illumina reads, they actually had a different region of kind of hotspots. They were found um, in the consensus sequence um, across um, the the string graph. So they um, both HiFi and uh, the QV estimates from both HiFi and Illumina on the top right hand side of the screen here are very different. And we thought we needed a method to more accurately um, quantify the QV estimate for this genome. So what we did was we took both of the um, the error camer the missing camers found in the Illumina. Um, and the HiFi data. And we found that the missing um, KMERS that were missing in Illumina um, reads, but found in HiFi data were enriched for GC content. And if the reads, um, if the KMERS were missing from the HiFi, but found in Illumina, they actually had an AT um, enrichment. So um, if we utilized one sequencing approach, we would be underestimating the QV because of these specific biases. So we decided to merge this and produce a hybrid KMER data set. When we produced this hybrid KMER data set, it was about uh, 1,094 KMERs, missing KMERs, and we estimated the QV to be 70.2. And so this was a, a much more accurate way to quantify and get an evaluation of a QV estimation here. We then wanted to dig into the homo homopolymers um, within this initial draft assembly. And to do this, Kishwar took on uh, this homopolymer contusion matrix using both the Illumina reads and um, the the hi-fi reads. And what we found was that longer homopolymers in the consensus, consensus sequence of the string graph were associated with length variability in the hi-fi reads, especially in the GC homopolymers. Um, we also found that um, the majority of the Illumina reads were concordant with the consensus. Therefore, it was kind of indicative that the hi-fi reads were giving us um, introducing error where it shouldn't be in the string graph. 
So upon this, both the QV and the homopolymer, we determined that the draft required more polishing to maximize its accuracy, but also to reduce errors related to systematic presence, uh, systematic presence of homopolymer specific issues or, or read specific or technology specific issues. Next, we needed to ensure we were using a reliable mapping, a mapping tool so that we could polish um, doing no harm. I won't go into detail just due to my time here, um, but the mapping tool that we selected was developed by Shirag Jain, um, who was a previous postdoc in Adam's lab, and we used Winamap2, and it, it outperformed other, other commonly used um, mapping tools. Basically, it is optimized for ONT impact biodata, um, specifically to deal with reads um, and re in re reliable mapping in repetitive regions of the genome. And it uses minimized uh, weighted minimizers to do that. And I've included the um, different papers to do with that here. Um, next, we had to call our uh, short nucleotide variants and our structural variants. We had, so we start, I'm going to start with our small um, nucleotide variants here. And we, I, these were any variants that were under 50 base pairs in length. So both SNPs and um, under 50 base pair indels predominantly. So the short reads for the Illumina, we used BWA to map. And for the long reads, we used Winomap. We then call the variants using deep variant for Illumina and Pack bio, we used a hybrid uh, deep variant approach. And for ONT, we used the pepper deep variant approach. This was only to call um, highly accurate SNPs in repetitive sequences. We chose the VAF and the GQ scores. Um, the GQ scores were um, I selected as a result of a calibration of the deep variant algorithm. The VAF scores actually we were selected because they reduce low frequency false positives. After we had all of these calls, we filtered using a tool called Murfin, um, which was developed by Giulio Fermenti. And these really remove uh, any erroneous camers that had been introduced during this, um, the polishing process. After this, uh, so uh, after all of this, we identified 993 small variants, most of which were in homopolymer corrected uh, corrections or they were in tumor repeats. The next part was to call uh, larger errors or structural errors. For this, we used short reads using Parliament 2, which has, um, which is kind of this umbrella tool that employs six different um, short read uh, structural variant uh, callers. And we only considered those structural variants if they were called by over two methods. So this, uh, when we looked at these, we found 14 were identified. For the long reads, we used um, Winomap and Sniffles, followed by Sniffles, and again, using only considering those that were identified using two sequencing technologies. So we had at our disposal ONT, HiFi, and CLR. So we only used if they, um, we only considered those structural variants that were called using two sequencing techs. To identify any structural variants specifically in the centromeres, we employed tandem tools followed by sniffles. And tandem tools is has been developed to uh, specifically um, for mapping within centromere uh, centromeric sequences, so to handle the the repeat structure there. We found very few errors, um, structural errors. Um, we did find three medium assembly errors that we corrected, and we found 44 heterozygous um, structural variants as well. Through this process, we also identified um, a missing telomere on chromosome 18 at the P-arm. And so we um, actually patched that using ONT. We um, oh, the ONT reads and we polished it using HiFi. And I'm just showing you before when we mapped the bio nanomolecules, you can see this buildup 
indicative of um, a compression of the, the tila, that we were not representing the full telomer. But after we patched using the ONT and the polished with the HIFI, you can see the bio nanomolecules are much more um, evenly distributed, uh, indicating that we had actually the full sequence um, completed there. Uh, we wanted to ensure that anything that we were, any polishing edits that we introduced into the assembly, that we were validating that they were actually true uh, tr true errors and not false positives, or they were not heterozygous variants within this haplotidiform form mole. Um, so we used um, a marker assisted mapping approach. And so here we identify single copy markers. These are markers that are only uniquely found in the assembly and only appear as a single copy in the reads. And so the, this allows us to guide if there's, these were kind of evenly distributed across the genome we found um, with about a thousand markers in every 10 kilobase pair window. Uh, but there were marker deserts within the centromeres, the satellites, the RDNAs, for instance. So we couldn't really use this method there. Um, and what this really allows you to do, if you just look on the bottom right hand side of the, the slide here, you'll see that um, this is one of just the SNP calls. And if you have a high density of these unique markers around it, you're more confident that this is an accurate SNP call or a structural variant call. And so this is how we went in and manually inspected each of the structural variants that were called um, during the SNP calling process. So the first version, um, we introduced that four kilobase pair telomer um, on the chromosome 18 PR. We fixed one deletion and two, uh, two insertions. We, uh, and then we fixed the 993 small, um, small nucleotide variants. So you can see that here that the, um, the error camers that are still present are evenly and uniformly distributed along each chromosome, suggesting that errors were not clustered in hotspots within certain genomic regions and that the technology specific uh, introduction of errors was, was ultimately gone. So after this, we had in increased the QV of this assembly to 72.6. But on this inspection, we then realized that um, the telomeres actually were under, were not corrected using our method. So the polishing, um, so what happened here was that um, because of the repetitive nature of the telomeric sequence um, in the ONT platform, there was um, in both platforms, ONT and HiFi, there's a natural decrease in coverage coming toward the end of the chromosome. Um, but for ONT, there's actually a strand bias. Um, we use the ultra long protocol here, and we found that there we could we only had my, uh, negative strands on the the p arm and positive strands on the q arm, and this led to inaccurate um, and under calling within the telomeres. So it caused this that we were not actually polishing the telomeres through our approach. So after we rectified the algorithm of deep variant, uh, the pepper deep variant algorithm to accommodate the strandedness of the ONT data, we identified 454 additional corrections that we made. And we fixed about 90% of those. So overall, we released the version 1.1 gapless polished assembly, and the, uh, the increase here was to a QV of 73.9. Um, so that was a huge increase. We only actually ended up um, fixing about 1,500 corrections, mostly within the homopolymers or microsatellites. And we removed, um, and really we disentangled what words platform specific biases versus real errors in the genome. What we found that, that reliable mapping really, really is key. And one thing that we did come, um, it was an outcome that I didn't get time to discuss today that we, we did use and benchmark automated approaches against our approach. And what the best automated approach that we did find was the, um, starting with a Raycon based polish, uh, polishing method 
and then following up with Murfin if you have Illumina data available. But uh, just remain, a, a reminder in these situations that you just need to mind the heterozygous introductions because they can cause haplotype switches. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I think this we're going to take some questions now. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes. So I'm going to try to direct at least one question to each speaker. Um, I, the first question is for Nadesh. Uh, this is from Sagin Din. Sorry if I'm not getting the names correctly. But the question is, is very nice talk. HiFiASM has its own implemented purge function. Have you tried using it without and with purge dupes afterwards? If yes, did you observe better results combining both? That I showed uh, for HiFiASM is the one where it's already supposed to have purged uh, so with the, the function of uh, haplotic purging of uh, purge of uh, high fiasm uh, but uh, unfortunately it's often not sufficient but i could also try purging on the not purge high fiasm assembly i guess um the the next question will be for Anne. This is from Antonin Kubau. Uh, great talk, Anne. For human genome polishing without causing harm uh, can be done because we know a bit about what at the end results should look like. But what about other taxa genomes where we have no idea? Yeah, um, so obviously doing this on a human, uh, we are incredibly lucky because GRC, we had GRC H38 as always this comparative marker to kind of keep us on track. So um, yes, that is why we thought it important as part of this work to ensure that we benchmarked it against tools that are more readily used by in the field. So the polishing team, we had experts from international experts. There were 15 of us. We had time to manually validate every single structural variant uh, because we could distribute those tasks. And that's just impractical if you're a bioinformatician working on a, a single species, right? You're not spending um, your time looking manually through 1,500 different uh, corrections and validating absolutely every single one of them, obviously. So um, that's why we thought, OK, we'll benchmark an automated approach and try to make a suggest a recommendation based off a more automated um, approach. And um, what we did find was that Raycon alone actually wasn't the best approach. Um, when you iteratively polish, there's a plateau of, um, of how much that obviously improves. Um, even after one round of polishing. Um, so there's a definite plateau and also these haplotype switches happen so that you get these unwanted switch of haplotypes, introduction of heterozygous variants, and also that we found there were some frame shift, frame shift errors introduced that impacted genes. So that a protein co um, coding gene would switch um, be a, a change in after polishing with Raycon, a protein coding gene um, was deactivated. Um, so it wouldn't have been identified. So it was just trying to be careful of that. And so we tried then the approach of pairing it with Murfin. So after each round of Raycon, we were following that up with a filtration step after an automated filtration step of using Murfin, which uh, which checks every uh, the assembly that every introduced correction is present in the reads, basically. So it's this kind of double check. Um, so that was the strategy that we came up with for how to make this more automated and more um, a guide for people uh, in the field. Um, that don't have the luxury of the kitchen sink of 
sequencing technologies, the volume of data and the personnel needed to do uh, a do no harm approach in this way. I will say though, the, that Kishwar did put a good bit of effort into trying his best to make um, a GitHub that goes through um, all of the steps that we employed as part of this do no harm approach. Um, and so there is a GitHub there that makes it slightly automated, um, which was a request by the nature methods reviewers, which was, I thought it was a really good for like reproducibility that they encouraged actually making a pipeline in the workflow. So you can use it there too. Um, the next question will be for uh, Nadej again from uh, Maria Del Mar Munis. Uh, great work. I wonder if for downstream analyses, you want to analyze each haplotype separately. Uh, will you split the reads using the KMERS per haplotype before you produce the context? Uh, yeah, so um, in this case, uh, well, this is kind of what we, well, this is what we do uh, right now in the lab that I'm working in. Uh, so uh, if you want to analyze both haplotypes, then you just need to produce a phased assembly, uh, which is becoming more and more possible because uh, now with uh, high accuracy long reads, uh, it's uh, more adapted uh, for uh, phasing uh, haplotypes because before the, the problem before with low accuracy long reads is that uh, the the error rate uh, was too high to differentiate errors and alternative haplotypes. Uh, and so now uh, with higher accuracy reads, um, it's not perfect yet, but uh, it, there's been a drastic improvement uh, in what can be done for phase assembly. Uh, and there are, uh, high, it's possible with high fiasm it's possible with uh, Virco. Uh, and so then, yeah, if you want to study the haplotypes, the most straightforward way to go is to phase your assembly. OK, so then the next question will be again for Anne. Um, this is from Abhisek Chakarborty. Great talk. I was wondering uh, which sequencing data or combination of sequencing data will be the best approach for a highly heterozygous and polyploid genome assembly. That's a great question. <laughs> You're throwing a very hard uh, species at me. So I, I, this actually rings true to my first postdoc where I worked on stick insects in New Zealand, which were the most heterozygous, massive genomes I've ever worked with. And at the time, um, this was three years ago, we, uh, I only had at my disposal 9x ONT data and um, Illumina, no, I was Chromium 10x data um, to use to assemble five gigabase um, triploid uh, <laughs> <laughs> hybrid stick insects, which was a nightmare, but I learned a lot from that experience. Um, yeah, recommendations for that. I, I think that the standard recommendation that we're giving now is really that it's beneficial to have the hi-fi based assembly, but also if you can generate ultra long reads and use Virco, um, I would highly recommend that um, as an approach. Not everybody has those technology, the, the access to both of those technologies for sure, but that would be what I would recommend for a polyploid uh, with high, high heterozygosity in those situations. Uh, thank you. So I think we have about five more minutes left in our session. So I think we can take one or two more questions. So the next one will be, will be for Nadej. Um, this is again from Antonin Tibal. Sorry if, for, if I'm messing up people's names. Um, nice talk. How can you know for certain if you are looking at an uncollapsed haplotype region or at a recent real genome region duplication? Do you have a way to tell them apart? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, in the that's where the chemo plots are uh, really useful because also you may have noticed when I showed the Busco plots that even after haplotic purging, there were still a, a bunch of uh, uh, du uh, duplicated uh, orthogs that were still there, which is normal because in fact the genome that I showed you is a paleo tetraploid, so that's why you have duplications that are there. But in this case, that's where it's really important to look at the chemo plots, because in the chemo plots, uh, if uh, your region is actually uh, duplicated in the genome, then uh, the chemo for this region uh, will be uh, more represent will have a higher multiplicity in your chemo plot, so they won't be in your uh, homozygous peak. They may be in another bump in your chemo plot a bit further. So if you have, a, um, if you're aiming for a collapse assembly and you have a, a chemers in 2x in your homozygous peak, uh, this is not duplications. If th you should have another peak at higher multiplicity uh, in which, yes, the chemers will be in two copies or even more copies. Are, um... uh, we're closing out the session and uh, we're moving on to Lino. Well, of this workshop. Um, so the last session is about finishing genome assembly. Also a little bit about the applications of having a reference genome. Uh, the first to talk will be Mathieu Seppé and Matthew Berkeley. Uh, Mathieu is a postdoc and Matthew is a programmer in the Dopnov group at the University of Geneva and Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. And they are part of a team that develops and maintains the Busco software for assessing the quality of genomics data in terms of gene content completeness. So please, Matthew, Mathieu, the stage is yours. Uh, yeah, it's Matthew who's going to start. I'm, going, I'm going to talk first. So, yeah, so I will give the floor to Matthew after a few slides. Okay. Uh, okay, do you see the first slide with the title? Okay, excellent. Um, so we're going to present you the detail of the Busco tool that was um, mentioned before, um, that is developed in our group in Geneva, uh, in the group of um, professors Dobnov. Um, so I am Mathieu Seppé, and I've been involved in the development of Busco from version two uh, with Rob Waterhouse. Um, and I'm going to explain the basics uh, behind the Busco markers, uh, how it is selected, why it is useful. And then uh, Matthew Berkeley, who is the, now the active developer of the current version of Busco, will uh, get into more detail about how the Busco software works um, and how to use it well. So, um, the goal of uh, an assembly is, of course, to get the best representation possible of your organism genomes as uh, bioinformatics sequences. Um, and usually, you know, um, from your organisms, a few, uh, you have a few informations. You may know the number of chromosomes and uh, the estimated size of the genome. So uh, ideally, what you should get is an assembly that will be made of um, a number of sequences matching the number of chromosomes of your organism um, that sums up to uh, the size of your estimated genome. Um, you can note here that I simplified a bit the situation with um, a haploid genome. But um, in reality, what you get will be contigs. 
um, uh, a certain number of them um, that will be higher than the number of chromosome um, of uh, a size. So here I, uh, I choose to represent a size that is lower than the estimated genome size. Uh, but for what I've seen um, early, early this afternoon, uh, you may end up with a, a genome that is oversized. Uh, but anyway, what you want to do is to evaluate how good this assembly is um, in order to choose whether you have to invest more in your assembly process. Um, and one of the, the way to do, to do so is to use uh, a measure of contiguity with the N50. So as a reminder, N50 is the size of a contig about which half of your genome stand. But as uh, it was demonstrated before today, um, this metric um, uh, does not uh, represent truly uh, the quality and the completeness of your genome. Um, another approach is to focus on the genes. Um, so one interesting point about genes is that um, it is actually, uh, it has a biological meaning. So if you are able to estimate uh, how many genes you obtained in your genome, you learn something about the biology, which is always good compared to technical metrics. So again, um, um, in your organisms, um, the genome will code for um, a certain number of genes. And ideally, what you want is to annotate all of them in uh, perfectly assembled genomes. But again, you will get contigs, and these contigs uh, will contain um, a certain number of these genes. Um, and we can use, uh, we can predict them and use this gene content to, um, as a proxy to evaluate the quality of your genome. Um, so if we imagine a certain number of genes um, in your species, uh, what you may get in uh, your assembled genome will be genes that will be uh, completely and properly uh, assembled and annotated. But you may have uh, genes that remain fragmented because they may be uh, at the, the border of a contig. You may have genes that uh, were not assembled or predicted at all, so they're missing. Um, and you may have uh, genes that, that are present twice. So the question is, is it uh, um, a biological reality or is it an artifact? And um, Busco was designed um, at the time Ill Illuminaris were used uh, for uh, genome assembly. And um, uh, we see now that um, assembly, of course, uh, are getting better. Completeness is getting better. But Busco is still useful as, uh, for instance, uh, there are challenges um, about um, uh, understanding whether the, the duplication are two biological or artifacts. So now we have uh, genes in our species. We can predict them. But uh, we need to assess whether they are true or not. And to assess whether uh, what we predict is true, we have to use something that we know. And we don't know the, the full gene content of our species of interest. So instead, we will use something that we know about the group of organisms to which uh, these species belong. And for instance, uh, if you focus on a group of organisms, uh, let's say insects, um, they are feature, um, uh, they are phenotypic uh, feature, let's say at the macroscopic level, uh, that you know um, appears in all um, the species belonging to the group because uh, they are a feature of that group. So for instance, insects, you will expect them to all have six legs. Um, and likewise, if you uh, focus on the genome, there will be gene, so features, um, that will be found in all the species, so all the genome that you will uh, sequence within a group. And so that's the idea behind the Busco marker genes um, that are used to create data sets that will be uh, used to 
predict this marker in your genome. So using the, the software that has the same name as the marker um, to give you a score that is uh, an estimate of your genome quality. So these universal single copy orthologs are the key uh, to doing this. So orthologs are genes um, uh, found in different species that um, share a last common ancestor by uh, speciation. So how do we create these data sets of uh, BUSCO markers? Uh, for that, we use uh, the OrthoDB catalog of orthologs. That is uh, a database we uh, also uh, develop and maintain in our lab. Um, and so this catalog of orthologs uh, contains groups. And uh, some of the groups will have the, um, the properties we want for BUSCO markers that are um, that uh, the, um, the marker is present in all the species uh, in the group of interest. Um, actually, we use a threshold of 90% to account for error or real uh, rare biological duplication uh, or uh, loss. Uh, so it should be present in 90% of the species and uh, be single copy in 90% of the species. So the fact that we want markers that are single copy is exactly for what we've seen before, to be able to judge whether uh, a duplication found in your assembly is a uh, biological or an artifact. And these markers uh, should uh, remain single copy and uh, a high duplication score should indicate artifacts. So the BUSCO sampling space um, is at a very specific part of the distribution of the orthologue groups. Um, so the BUSCO, um, the, um, it, uh, it stands for universal, but actually uh, as uh, with BUSCO, we, we create lineage specific data sets. So it means uh, our marker, they are universal, but within the group of interest. Um, we have uh, data sets that are at the root uh, of the tree, um, but uh, if you want to get a high resolution when investigating um, a species assembly, uh, the best is to, to use uh, marker genes that are shared within a group uh, that, each, uh, that, is, that is much more specific to your species. Um, so, um, with uh, BUSCO v3, uh, a few years ago, we had uh, 50 uh, data sets at the time. Uh, and now with uh, BUSCO v5, uh, we have almost um, 200 lineage specific data sets of markers um, that covers uh, eukaryotes, so animals, uh, plants, uh, fungi, and uh, other microbial eukaryotes. As well as, well as uh, many uh, groups of prokaryotes. Um, so that is for um, the BUSCO marker datasets. And these are used uh, by the BUSCO software to do the genome uh, completeness evaluation. And for that, uh, I will give the floor to Matthew, who is going to talk about the detail on how this software works. Okay, Matthew. Thanks, thanks, Matthew. Uh, so you can see my slides. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, so uh, with Busco, we offer uh, two official um, distribution uh, mechanisms: one with Conda and one with Docker. Um, and it's also possible to do a manual installation. Um, so if you're using uh, conda, the installation command is simply uh, conda, and then you, you create your environment. You uh, include the conda channels uh, to access all the dependencies, and then you, you specify the Busco version. So uh, it's important to specify the version that you want, the, the latest version, because um, if you don't, it might, uh, it might not necessarily take the, uh, the most recent updates. Um, we found sometimes Conda can be a little bit uh, slow installing. So if that's the case for you, I recommend using Mamba instead. 
So that just means installing Mamba and then replacing Mamba for the Conda command. And that's usually a lot quicker and it can resolve any installation problems with Conda. Uh, the other official um, distribution that we have is uh, a Docker image. This, uh, this Docker container is based on the Conda package. Uh, so it's built on top of that. Uh, so to you can pull that from source using this command and then run it by specifying your user ID and then mounting your current working directory with your input file and where you want to write the output folder. Um, and then you, you, say, you specify the image and then follow it by the busco command, which I'll, I'll explain uh, now in a second. The other way to install is to do a manual installation. Uh, this is probably only for more advanced users um, because there's a lot of dependencies um, to install. You can get the full details at the user guide, but there's 10 third-party components that need to be installed and verify that they're working independently um, and all the paths are set up correctly. So it's, it's a little bit more work, but if you want to fine tune the versions of dependencies, you can do it this way as well. But generally I would recommend you using Conda or Docker because everything is working out of the box. So the busco command uh, is simply just busco on the command line. And then there's three mandatory parameters that you need to run busco. Uh, the first is the input file. Uh, and you, you can also add a folder containing uh, multiple input files. So there's a batch mode that works now. So you can give it multiple inputs and get multiple outputs on a table with, with all of the results uh, for multiple uh, input files. You specify the output results, the name of the output results folder that you want, um, and then specify the mode. Currently, there are three uh, modes. There's the genome mode, the transcriptome mode, and the protein mode. Uh, shortly, there will be a virus mode as well. That's one of the uh, releases that's coming up in the, in the pipeline. So other useful options uh, that, that you can use, you can specify a lineage data set. So as uh, Matthew said, there's, there's specific lineage data sets available based on OrthoDB 10. Uh, these are divided into bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota trees. Uh, we also have virus data sets. And we would generally recommend uh, choosing the most specific data set to your assembly because the more marker genes that you have, the better resolution uh, you'll have for, for your assembly assessment. So an exception to this might be if you need a, a faster or a rough estimate of a draft assembly that you're iterating over, you could choose a, a parent data set like eukaryota, which has fewer marker genes and it'll run a lot quicker. Or if you're comparing species or doing phylogenomics with the markers, you can use the latest common ancestor of the species that you're working with. You can also specify the number of CPUs if you're running on a distributed cluster. You can restart a previous run without having to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, and you can force override a previous run as well. Uh, there's a lot more options. You can get them all with the help uh, flag. And I'm not going to go through them all now, but uh, they're all explained in the user guide and also here in the if you, if you do busco-h. If you don't want to uh, work on the command line, you can just uh, create a config file and put all of the parameters in the config file. So you'll just have to call busco and then just the one parameter config with your config file. Inside the config file, you can specify the input file, output folder, uh, and so on. You can toggle the various options that are there by uncommenting the lines. That's another option that's available. So when you run busco and you specify a, a data set, it'll download the data set automatically. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you would like to uh, download the data sets independently of a busco run, there is a download command. You can just use the busco command again with the download flag. You can specify the data set name. Uh, and then you can specify any of the, the, the tags, all prokaryota, eukaryota, or virus to download the, a subset of all of the data sets available. So here is a diagram of the Busco pipeline. Uh, for users who are familiar with version three, uh, you see in gray, the gray column is what version three had. So it's expanded considerably in the last few years uh, to version five where we are now. The biggest addition uh, has been the, the auto select lineage pipeline. Um, this is primarily useful for microbial genomics. And uh, 
if you're doing metagenomic uh, analysis as well. So I will be talking about that today. I'll be focusing on if you're running uh, Busco specifying a lineage. So you'll start by running your Busco command to specify your input assembly or the folder containing multiple input assemblies. You'll have your output results folder. You'll specify the mode. And since version 5.4, if you specify the genome mode, You'll also get a printout of the, the assembly statistics like N50 um, and other statistics that are given by the BB Tools module. And then you can specify the lineage data set, in this case, Diptera from ODB10. So the first step of the pipe, well, based on the lineage data set that you select, Busco will know which pipeline to run. So it'll run eukaryota if you specify a eukaryota uh, data set. Um, so the first step in the pipeline is the the gene predictor step. Uh, there are two options here. The default option is to run MetaUK, uh, whereas the older version three pipeline ran BLAST followed by Augustus. So we've made MetaUK the default because it's considerably quicker in terms of runtime. And the uh, completeness scores that you get are comparable. There's there's no significant difference in, in, uh, in the, the, the output results. So for example, if you're running uh, running a selection of fungi genomes, um, you can get up to 10 times improvement in runtime by using MetaUK instead of the BLAST followed by Augustus. Um, the pipeline generally runs, or it, it runs twice. So the, the second time it'll take any missing or fragmented buscos and it'll use the ancestral variants of those buscos to try and match them with your assembly. So there, you can fine tune the first and second runs through the gene predictor based on the parameters in each of these uh, tools. You can find them in the various user guides for those tools. Um, so you can toggle the specificities or sensitivities that you need. Um, you can also use the Augustus long option if you choose this pipeline to get the full uh, the benefit of all the, the functionality of the Augustus scripts. So following the, the gene prediction step, the uh, results are passed to Hammer, where the, they are scored against the HMM profiles in the data set that you've selected. And then the, the results of Hammer are evaluated to give you the final Busco assessment result. And if you just if you specify the lineage uh, data set, this is the final result. Um, <clears throat> so there are four numbers. Uh, the first is the complete and single copy uh, score. That's the number you want to be as high as possible. Uh, if you, it's a it's a measure of how uh, good your assembly is. Um, there's also the the duplicated score, so this can be useful, as has been mentioned by previous speakers. Um, to uh, so, for example, if you're running the genome pipeline, it can help to remove haplotypic duplications, and if you're running it in transcriptome or protein mode, then it can help to remove isoforms. Uh, and you can use it to iterate and improve your assembly. So the two are fragmented buscos, which are present but not complete, and then some missing buscos. Uh, so uh, these numbers can help you to, to uh, iterate over your, your uh, ass assembly to get the best result possible. So some best practices when using busco is uh, to be up to date. So we're continuously improving the pipeline with uh, minor and major releases, new features, bug, bug uh, fixes, that kind of thing. So we're, um, we're regularly updating the data sets and uh, to provide new ones. So if you're just always check to see, to make sure you're using the, the most recent version, you can use Conda update Busco to make sure you've got the, the most recent one if you're using Conda. Um, and we're, we're updating the data sets as well. So uh, OrthoDB11 is in the works. And then shortly after that, there'll be new data sets based on, on that uh, on that new release for OrthoDB as well. Uh, work by iterations. So you find the best methods to assemble or annotate your species. Explore the various tools and combinations and uh, some different parameters. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, space, I guess, to, to toggle with some of these parameters. Uh, you can produce an, an assembly quickly and then assess it with Busco and then iterate, try it again with different parameters. Uh, and then you can, we always recommend to run Busco with the most specific lineage uh, to get the best results. Um, another thing is that you can compare the, the, the results you get with your genome 
assembly to the protein annotation file. So you, you can run the genome mode and then run the protein mode. And if you in the genome mode, that is an indication that you can improve your annotation pipeline. Uh, if the opposite is the case, if your protein mode result is greater than your genome mode, that's an indication that your annotation is, is good. And perhaps Busco is struggling to predict the structure of some of the genes, uh, and so it underestimates the true score. Busco can also be used for uh, metagenomics. It's not just for eukaryotes, it's for prokaryotes as well. Uh, you can use auto lineage mode for your metagenomic assemblies. Um, and it's the only tool that's available to evaluate both microbial eukaryotes and prokaryotes. We've got currently, we've got 27 viral data sets. Uh, we're working on a, a, an expanded virus mode that will be released later this year. So some other applications of Busco, we've got some, we developed some companion pipelines that can be used, uh, for example, computing phylogenomic trees. Um, and there's also some visualization tools like visual, visualizing syntonies and uh, visualizing where the complete duplicated fragmented uh, genes are in, in your assembly. Uh, to get more information on these, I refer you to our paper in current protocols, which has a step-by-step -step approach to go through all of the various different pipelines in Busco and the additional companion pipelines. Uh, the paper describing the tool itself was released last October, uh, and that's got the information on all of the, the new features that we have in version five and the data sets as well. Uh, so this is the Busco team. Uh, so Mose, Matthew, and myself uh, are the, the uh, core team at the moment. Uh, Felipe, is, uh, he was one of the original developers, and Evgeny is the group leader. So thank you for your time, and we're free to answer any questions now or maybe after the next talk. I don't know what the organizers want to do. Thank you, Mathieu and Matthew. And we are now, it's time for the last speaker of the day, um, Tanya. Tanya Schwander is an associate professor at the University of Lausanne. Um, her research focuses on the diversity of reproductive system in animals, from sexual reproduction in systems with two or more different sexes to parthenogenesis. And in her talk, she will demonstrate the power and usefulness of using high quality reference genomes in her in the studies. So please, Tanya. Um, yes, I'm still trying to share my screen, actually. <laughs> yes, can you see it in full mode now? Okay, yeah, so like Lino said, um, focus of my talk, it's not really how, but more why. Um, what, what you do when you actually have a genome. Um, and the focus I will illustrate is with one specific example. And that's um, this example is the consequences of partner genesis, so a particular mode of reproduction for um, gen genome evolution. Um, so for a bigger context, you know, the ability re to reproduce is the key, um, the key trait that distinguishes living organisms from inorganic matter, which is you know, nicely illustrated by this little earwig that takes care of, of their babies. Um, so given this is such an important trait, one could think that you know, there should be maybe one perfect strategy to achieve reproduction in all organisms. But this is, of course, uh, not the case. There are lots of different types of um, reproductive strategies. And the one we are most interested in in my lab is the transition from, from the type of reproduction we know best in animals, which is sexual reproduction with separate sexes um, here on the left. Um, and then you can have this transition to partner genesis in, in female-only species. So in my lab, we're interested know generally how these transitions occur or through which mechanisms what are the selective forces and what is of course the purpose of this um, workshop today is how this this trait will affect affect um, genome evolution now there are many theoretical or conceptual reasons why we would expect um, this this to affect the, the mode of reproduction why would this this why would ex we would expect it to affect genome evolution um, but test theoretical predictions is actually pretty hard. And the reason for this is that 
asexuality is of course a lineage level trait it's a characteristic of a species which is of course the um, the key aspect for many traits we are interested in you know any kind of phenotype physiology life history trait it's it's typically something that, that characterizes a species so applying all these methods you heard about heard about today for one species not is not going to help you very much because whatever you find you there's no way of knowing if your findings are linked to the feature you're interested in in our case reproductive mode or if this is just some species or lineage specific um, feature so what you actually have to do if you're interested in a lineage level trait is you have to apply lineage level replication so in our case meaning um, you have to compare genomes of multiple asexual species with multiple sexual species and look for sort of shared uh, shared patterns in these in these different contrasts and we are working with a group of species, with a group of insects, actually, that allows us to do this. And these are so-called Tamima, Tamima stick insects. So Tamima is a small genus of a bit more than 20 described species. They occur um, on the West Coast, in North America. And uh, you can see here a little phylogeny with a bunch of red species. These are all the species that have classical sexual reproduction, so with males and females. And all the species in blue, they have independent, evol independently evolved obligate asexual reproduction. So these are the contrasts we are interested in. We are going to compare the genomes of um, the sexual with each asexual species within a, within a pair. So here we are talking about you know, comparing 10 genomes and not generating one um, reference genome. So these species have a couple of attributes. In, in, in our field, there are a lot of asexual species. Somebody has asked this, the, the question in a previous run um, about polyploids or you know, highly heterozygous species. So this is a, the case in many asexual species, not for uh, Thymema here, they're all diploid and not of hybrid origin. So they don't, they're not supposed, let's say, it's not supposed to have un, unusual heterozygosity levels. Anyway, so this is the system we work with and we are interested in genomic consequences um, of asexuality. Okay, so we, we have looked at many, many consequences. Um, today, I just want to talk about two of them. Uh, the first one is the if efficiency of selection, how this affects genome evolution. And the second point is um, heterozygosity. Um, this is the first time that I ever use this slide because normally, um, I, I, I mean, I, we are interested in the biology. We're not so much interested in the technology per se. For us, the technology is more of a hurdle we have to overcome to actually address the questions we're interested in. Um, but nevertheless, so we have generated 10 reference genomes for, so five genomes for each, um, uh, for each, so one genome for each of the five sexual species and one genome for each of the five asexual species. And the technology we have used, it's about 60x, 60x nanopore. And then we have polished um, the nanopore assembly with um, Illumina data. So the assembly itself was generated on, the, on, a, on a single female. Um, then we did, we, we used uh, a quite stringent decontamination approach. That's something that nobody touched upon during this talk uh, or this, this workshop. It's actually quite important. I can highly recommend the blog tools to do this. So we decontaminate our original assemblies, then we purge um, haplotics, not, not as explained in detail why this is really useful. And at the end, we did scaffolding with high C data. So this, the high C data, this was based on a different individual than the, than the female we used for the original genome assembly. Um, so you can see on the, on the heat map on the left, we were quite happy with how this worked out. So this is the example for one of the species. Um, we have pretty good carrier type information for all of our 10 species, so we know how many chromosomes to expect. Um, and well, in, in, a, in a pretty simple approach, we immediately got, we got our, um, our 12 expected chromosomes. And um, you just heard a long talk about Busco, so we evaluated, I can give you some statistics, this is just for one of, one of the species to illustrate. Um, so we have in our or, original assembly, we have uh, about 1,100 scaffolds, but actually the 12, 12 super scaffolds correspond to our um, 12, or 12 uh, chromosomes. And our Busco scores are essentially as good as, as they could possibly get. So we have only four missing Busco genes. And in fact, these, these Busco genes, they're, they're probably actually biologically missing. It's not that we don't detect them, um, 
the reason I say this is we have other genomes in, in different stick insects. So we have some triploids, uh, other polyploid uh, genomes of, of very distantly related stick insects, and they miss the exact same four uh, Busco sheets. Anyway, so short message, we're pretty happy with our, uh, with our reference genomes. So once when you have these what when you have these reference genomes, so I guess this is why the organizers asked me to give a talk in this workshop where I typically don't fit, <laughs> given given the things we are interested in. So what do you do once you actually have these genomes? So there are sort of classical things you can do, which is uh, what is this supposed to illustrate here? You can look for, you know, big scale rearrangements or you know. Yeah, so chromosomal rearrangements, shifts in, in repeat landscapes and things like this. Or on this slide here, you can see on the right, um, we have a highly conserved chromosome. We now know that the X, the X chromosome is, has been conserved for, for about 120 million years. Um, but the kind of questions that we are interested in, they're much more um, conceptually driven. So we are not so much interested in describing genome structures and you know, finding the perfect genomes. We are trying, our aim is to test um, sort of theories linked to, to benefits, cost and benefits of, of sexual reproduction. And one of the most universal prediction um, linked to different reproductive modes is that asexuality, so the absence of sex, this should reduce the efficiency of selection. And this is what this cartoon is supposed to illustrate. Um, if, you are, if you are an asexual species, well, you produce, you know, diploid, in, in our case, in the Taimima case, you, you produce diploid eggs instead of haploid gametes, and you don't have genetic exchange between individuals to generate a new zygote. This means that all your genes, all these, these, little, uh, these little animals, they're supposed to be different genes. If you're an asexual species, you're always, si always sitting in the boat with a whole bunch of other individuals. And these other individuals, they may be good rowers or bad rowers, but your fate depends on, on who else you sit in the boat with. Um, so this is this is this is what selective interference does. Actually, the, it, your success does, doesn't only depend on how good you are yourself, but it depends on who else you are associating with. Whereas under sexual reproduction, so this is the example below, because we have meiosis, you have you have re recombination and you reshuffle um, alleles across uh, individuals across generations. You have a genetic exchange between individuals. This allows selection to act in effect effectively and individually on each of those genes. So in a case, in, in the case of sex, you are able to select the best variant on, on each gene um, individually. So this, this, um, this effect of asexuality, this should result in two consequences at the genome level. The first is that asexuals should have a higher load of deleterious mutations in their genome. And the, the second consequence is they should have a slower rate of adaptive evolution than sexual species. And this is, this is what we have tested. Well, we have used Taimima to test. Uh, we have used Taimima genomes to test for, for these specific predictions. Um, here I have to apologize because actually the slides or the results, the results I'm showing you now, they're not actually based on our uh, new chromosome level genomes. They're largely based on more fragmented uh, Illumina based uh, technology um, genomes. I just, I haven't updated all of them yet because it's, uh, it's relatively recent that we have finished the proper annotations of all of these genomes. Um, in a nutshell, I can tell you that many of the patterns stay the same. But of course, we have about so in our original genome assemblies, the Illumina based ones, we had about 15,000 genes, and now we have about 34 uh, nicely annotated genes. So it's what we have a much different, we can, we can go into much more detail and we have much more information on how specific gene categories are affected. Anyway, um, so the, um, the first prediction we tested was this, this prediction that there should be more deleterious mutations in asexual genomes than in sexual genomes. And the way we did this is by um, looking at population polymorphism data. So uh, uh, calling SNPs within, you know, within resequencing data and looking in coding regions, how many polymorphic sites we had. And our assumption is that typically a gene that has, you know, that is, con that is highly conserved, you can detect as a one-to-one -one orthologue um, relatively easily. These genes, they should be generally on the purifying selection. So you can look at um, the proportion of sites that have mutations that will affect the amino um, acid sequence 
compared to the proportion of sites um, with polymorphisms that does not affect the amino acid sequence. So this is you, what you use to correct for the underlying mutation rates. And if you do this kind of comparison, um, you can see that within each of our five species pairs, we consistently see that the asexual species has a higher frequency of polymorphisms um, that affect the amino acid sequence than the sexual relative. So this is exactly what we were predicting. You know, more selective interference between loci and asexuals should result in a larger loads of, of segregating deleterious or presumably deleterious mutations. So like I mentioned, these are population polymorphisms. So of course, selection over time can still remove these, um, these polymorphisms, but it will take some amount of time. So we also looked at um, the rate of fixation of these polymorphisms. And for this, um, we are not looking at poly, um, population polymorphism. So this is looking at the actual reference uh, allele that is in the in the in our reference genomes, and we are looking on this is like a model fitting on on phylogenies. We look at the terminal branches in the phylogenies that are specific to asexual or sexual species, and we estimate this this rate or this ratio of um, um, non synonymous to synonymous mutation fixations. And here again, we find um, we find support for this theoretical prediction that asexual species should fix deleterious mutations at a faster rate than sexual ones. So there's an overall difference, but in this case already you can see that there is um, one species pair actually where the trend where the trend is opposite. So of course many of these predictions are affected not just by reproductive modes. In this case here, the efficiency of selection, for example, it, it also depends on on actually census population sizes and and, and many other things. So uh, this is yet another reason. In addition to the lineage specific uh, features, it's another reason why you want to actually replicate the the traits that you are interested in. We also looked at another type of deleterious mutations. Those are transposable elements. So like everybody knows transposable elements are these, uh, these, um, these uh, parasites, genetic parasites that are able to copy themselves and um, insert themselves elsewhere in the genome, but they can pro proliferate like this with, within genomes. And if you if you consider it, it depends a bit on the on the model you're using, but if you consider most TEs as deleterious mut mutations, um, then we should make the same prediction as for, you know, SNPs, deleterious SNP mutations. You would expect a higher deleterious load in asexual than sexual species, so more a higher load of transposable element in sexual than asexual species. And this is what we looked at here. So we quantified, we built a um, transposable element library from the assembled reference genomes, and then we mapped, you know, re data to these libraries to quantify the load of each annotated element. Um, and in this case here, we actually don't find a difference between sexual and asexual species, contrary to what is predicted. So the way you have to read this is like this. Uh, uh, so again, in, always in blue are the asexual species, in red are the sexual species. You always have replicate individuals with of one reproductive mode um, are together. And the sex asex species of a pair, they're always like right next to each other. So there's no overall, no, there's no systematic difference that between between asexual and um, and, and sexual species. There's actually more variation in individuals. So the met methodological error, if you want, is larger than the, uh, the species the species differences. So this is quite unexpected. If you know some of the general patterns, people have looked at transposable element loads, for example, in non-recombining um, genome portions of sexual species. I mean, the Y chromosome in humans, for example, is a classical, uh, classical case. Um, so this very, in, in these non-recombining genome portions, it's very consistent that transposable elements are enriched. So why do we not see this in the case of, um, of asexual species? And we think that this is because of a um, survivorship bias. So of course, uh, what we are looking at are asexual species. So we think that actually we are looking at the tip of the iceberg. So we are looking at the small subset of those. We are looking at those asexual species that were actually able to persist um, over evolutionary time. We recognize them as species. They're not like a rare genotype um, within a large asexual species, for example. So we only see the ones that survived, and all the ones that originally emerged and then went extinct. Well, we don't see them. We, we don't see those. So this is my uh, castle analogy because 
originally most castles were built from wood and only a few of them were built from stone but nowadays we think that they were all you know like these nice uh, <laughs> fortresses built from rocks because these are the stones just because these are the only ones that um well they didn't rot away over time anyway so we think that this is the main reason that explains this difference between asexual species and non-recombining genome portions in sexual organisms so all the asexuals that did not have all the species that evolved asexuality and that did not have some sort of super effective uh, mechanism to keep the proliferation of transposable elements in check, all these species would have gone extinct. And what we are observing are in fact the subset of asexual species that have some mechanism of TE control um, in place. Okay, so um, this reduced efficiency of selection, of course, should not, not only or the selective interference between loci in asexual species should not only accelerate the rate of uh, deleterious mutation accumulation, it should also slow down the speed at which you can adapt to your environment. Um, there's some evidence from for this for this conceptual idea from experimental evolution um, studies, but there is there was thus far actually no evidence for this prediction in natural populations. Um, so we went to test this in uh, again with our Timema with our Timema genomes. Um, so in this case here, we were able to test this across uh, some seven thousand genes. So these are not all one-to-one -one orthologs across uh, ten species. We also used subsets. You know, we we, we just we only re we needed at least or we we requested at least three uh, orthologs presented at least three out of the five species pairs. Otherwise, we didn't have uh, enough power to do this. Um, and the way we did this again, we, we were running each, so this again, model, model testing. So we were running, um, we were testing each gene on each branch, whether there was any evidence for positive selection on one specific site on each branch. And then we were summing um, at the tips, the tips that are labeled in red or blue. We were just summing the number of genes that had any evidence for positive selection at at least one or more sites in any of these terminal branches. So this is what you can see in, in my bar plot. Um, again, the asexual species in blue and their sexual sister species in red. And with this, we were super excited because we actually did detect, uh, we did detect this signal of you know, significantly more evidence for positive selection in sexual species than in asexuals. So this is, this is the first time that, that anybody was able to show this in, in uh, natural populations. Now, I'm sure everybody, um, well, including ourselves, but of course, you would like to know what those those genes that evolve adaptively that have, that have been fixed through positive selection in sexual and partner genetic species, what, what are those genes? And this is, of course, unfortunately, where, where we hit the limits of, um, of our models, uh, of our model system. Um, one is that many of these genes don't have functional annotations. And even if they do have functional annotations, I actually don't believe, I mean, I can tell you a story about some of these genes or you can do enrichment tests and come up with a creative story, but I don't believe any of those because, well, I mean, uh, these are stick insects, so they have diverged some from Drosophila. There's like a 400 million years of, of divergence in between. And I mean, there's nothing else that is really that well annotated in terms of experimental evidence for what gene functions are. So I wouldn't really trust much, um, a lot of these gene annotations. But besides the annotation, the functional annotation problem, actually most of these um, positively selected genes, they are, um, they are species specific. So they're on the positive se selection in only one species, not in multiple, uh, multiple species. So you can't get at the, at the gene level, in, not at the functional level, but the gene, at the gene level, you cannot uh, you cannot look for sort of parallelism in, in um, selection for sex or selection for partner genesis or adaptations to partner genesis. Okay, so the the second, so this, so again, this first the data I showed you right now, this is based on you know coding genes. You actually don't need you don't need um, chromosome level uh, genome assemblies except for the part where you have much, you know, you will, it, will be better, it will be much easier to get, you get a much larger number of one-to-one -one orthologs, you will have better uh, power to detect, you know, specific patterns or look at, you, you're able to bin genes in different categories because you have many more of them. Um, so this is not a good argument for why you need really good genome assemblies, which is, so this is the reason why I added this second, um, the second aspect of consequences of asexuality for genome evolution, which is a consequence on, on heterozygosity. 
So of course, heterozygosity of a genome has uh, has many bio, has a, has actually great biological importance. Typical a typical aspect is you know hybrid vigor. Many agricultural species are F1 hybrids because their fruit is bigger. Or many species hybrid species have higher parasite resistance. Um, on the other side of the extreme, if you have very little heterozygosity, uh, this is typically associated with inbreeding depression. Uh, so heterozygosity per se is, is, a, is quite a, an important trait. So that's one reason why we are, we are interested in heterozygosity. Kind of contrast fitness uh, in competition assays between species that reproduce via sex or asexuality. But there's also a different reason, and that is one will predict heterozygosity to evolve very differently in sexual or asexual species. So heterozygosity, the divergence between your two um, alleles or two haplotypes at one locus. If you're a sexual species, of course, you have, you know, you have recombination, you have genetic exchange between individuals. This will tend to keep the two, the different haplotypes within a population um, kind of similar uh, to each other. Now, if you're an asexual species, now it depends how you do partner tenses, it depends on the specific mechanism. Um, but if you're, you know, functionally clonal, so if your if your daughters are a perfect copy of yourself, then essentially you, your two your two chromosomes they will evolve like two different species. So because there's no recombination, no segregation between these two chromosomes, they should accumulate mutations independently and kind of diverge from each other. So this is what is depicted on my figure here. If you go back to the coalescence, you know that when when the when alleles A and B split, this is for a for an asexual species. The longer ago, or the, the more time has passed since the origin of asexuality, the higher should your heterozygosity actually be, because your allele A and B, each of them will you know, accumulate mutations over time and, and diverge, which means your, your individual should become um, more and more heterozygous, whereas this should not be the case in a sexual species. Um, so our previous data in the stick insects suggested that stick insects are indeed functionally clonal, so we expected uh, asexual stick insects to be much more heterozygous than the, than the sexual ones. Um, but this is not at all what we observed. Um, so in one of the previous talks, somebody mentioned that KMR spectra are your friends. So we initially evaluated heterozygosity in sexual and asexual species by using um, KMR spectra. This is because the assembly quality is, was actually systematically biased by a reproductive mode. So here we wanted to evaluate heterozygosity in an unbiased way. So the heterozygosity we estimated based on KMR spectra are these bars in the bar plot. And um, technically, there are red bars and there are blue bars. But on the figure, you only see red bars. It's because the blue bars, there, the heterozygosity is, uh, estimate is so low that you, you, don't, you just don't see the, the estimated value. So you can see the you can see the five sexual species of Tamima, the red bars. We have a lot. We have quite a high level of heterozygosity, two two percent of heterozygosity. That's quite unusual. And we have some species that have more typical heterozygosity. But you can see that all our five asexual species, their heterozygosity level based on KMR spectra estimates, they were in fact so low that we could not distinguish between true heterozygosity and sequencing error in the, in this is based in, in even in the Illumina or in, uh, in HiFi data. Um, we then also called, we also then tried to estimate heterozygosity ba based on genotype calls and, you know, combining these different approaches allowed us to guess, you know, at, at, so the conclusion is that asexuals, instead of being highly heterozygous, they're actually extremely homozygous either completely homozygous or, or have very low heterozygosity. So in any case, their heterozygosity level is lower than, than 10 to the minus 5. Um, OK, sorry, I can skip this. So then, so now, why are they, why are they so homozygous? Um, this depends, of course, on the mechanism of how they achieve partner genesis. You know, do they... Um, how do they modify meiosis actually to achieve um, partner genesis? And depending on how they do this, you will expect heterozygosity to be to dis disappear completely, or you would expect it to accumulate or be present in one specific part of the um, of the genome. And this is where our um, chromosome level assemblies come in. So here I've given you just the six the six biggest um, chromosomes uh, um, in one of one of the species, and all these peaks that you see along each scaffold. These are places where um, we identified heterozygous uh, heterozygous regions. 
So this was relatively unexpected because we would have expected heterozygosity to be clustered in um, Central America regions, for example, or depending on the mode of partner genesis, you could assume they should be accumulated in telomeric regions. Um, but this is very obviously not the case. I put the chromosome morphologies for each scaffold uh, next to it. And also, if you look at one um, at one single uh, chromosome and you look across different individuals, so this is the same on the right, this is the same chromosome, the heterozygosity on the same chromosome for uh, a couple of uh, partner genetic individuals of one species. And here again, we see regions of hetero, we see the same regions that maintain heterozygosity. So we are currently evaluating how this is how this is possible if there's strong selection on certain regions to actually remain heterozygous. Or another problem we have is actually, um, you know, some of this heterozygosity is still almost certainly false positive heterozygosity. So we are uh, running different uh, approaches to reduce um, the false positive heterozygosity as as much as possible. Um, but it, so it's 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 very possible that they are actually they have lost most or all of their heterozygosity through um, through gene conversion, which is it, which is relatively unusual. So with this, I, uh, I uh, have uh, my take home message. Asexuality, as many, many other phenotypes we're interested in, those are lineage level trait, traits. So even if you have the best, most perfect error-free genome in the world, this is, this is not gonna tell you much about the phenotype or you know, a, a trait you're interested in. If you want to know about this, you need lineage level replication. And using this kind of lineage re replication, we have been able to um, provide support for predicted long-term benefits of sex in, na in natural populations. And we also you know, stumbled on some new problems, which is this feature of Thymema asexuals um, being completely or largely or completely homozygous and what uh, molecular mechanisms actually generate this. And with this, I just want to thank the, the people who did, who generated the analysis and data for this presentation and my collaborators, funding sources, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Tanya, and uh, all of you, actually, uh, for the great talks. Um, please, you are all invited to post your questions in the live Q&A. They can also be related to the to the other sessions, okay? Because we have only a few minutes left. I will just start with a question for Mathieu from uh, Sagan. Um, if there is no specific lineage data set for the lineage I'm working on for Busco, um, how can I request this or know when in the future a more specific lineage data set might be available? Is that for me or for the other Matthew? I thought it was for the other Matthew. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew or um, Matthew, I don't know. Well, I, 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 th I think um, there's no there's no method mechanism for requesting uh, the new just the new data sets. Um, we have uh, the OrthoDB 11 uh, that will be released at some point in the next few months, I think. Don't know the exact timeline for that and then on the back of that there will be new busco data sets released with probably even more uh, even finer resolution um but there's no there's no mechanism for requesting lineage data sets i'm afraid um i don't know matthew do you have anything to add to that no that that's a good we often get and um with auto db we're sam we're increasing the sampling uh, with what exists and we need uh, good data with a sufficient number of representatives to produce a data set so um, uh, we, we're getting more and more uh, but we we cannot generate one on demand uh, unfortunately yeah okay thank you i'm going back see if more questions appear um Lena seems to have dropped out. <laughs> um Tanya, over the, the millions of years that uh, separate the stick insects that you're looking at. Is the karyotype stable? 
I mean, within the genus that I was talking about, it's relatively stable. There's like two fusions and three fissions, but across the other stick insects that we analyzed, the X chromosome is completely conserved and everything else is so rearranged, we can't even align it. So I mean, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I will pick a question from the chat. Um, and the new assemblies are really amazing. You mentioned having double the number of predicted genes compared to the previous assemblies. This sounds quite dramatic. Is this real or are you still examining this? No, well, it's real. <laughs> and uh, um, the thing is, I mean, actually we had our genome assemblies ready a long time ago and then we did basic annotations and, you know, looked good enough, maybe a bit long. We had some 16,000 genes and that sounds a bit low, but you know, also not dramatic. And then I had a student student do isoseq for a project on sex determination. And then we found lots of novel genes in the isoseq data. And then we realized that there were lots of genes not annotated. And the reason for this is, I mean, we, we use different pipelines, you know, maker, and now we are now our annotations, the annotations we have are based on breaker. We have like a billion, I mean, we have huge amounts of RNA-seq data, tissues, sexes, developmental stages. But the problem that we have is that stick insects are very diverged from anything. Um, and actually most annotating pipeline, annotate, you know, they require some protein support. And we had very poor protein support in general. And then, I mean, the, in Breaker, you can actually set this. So we give, we give a lot of support to RNA-seq data and we require very little protein support. And, but because we have really good RNA-seq data, we, you know, we can actually, you can look at, well, this is annotated. And it's like, it's clearly, you know, it's nicely transcribed. We have very strong RNA-seq support. You have a nice CDS. It's just, there's no good homologous gene in, anywhere. So yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty sure that these are good, these are good annotations. Mm -hmm. I don't know who asked that. I don't know if that answers the question. So it's actually, it's mostly the annotation problem, not the, the genome problem. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, Lino, you're back. Um, we have two minutes left, so we kind of have to wrap up. Um, and I guess that, uh, you know, we will try to save these uh, questions in the chat and distribute them to the speakers so that we can uh, answer the unanswered questions at some point. Uh, Lino, if you want to wrap up. Yeah, okay. So it was, I think, I hope everybody was happy with this workshop. I, I hope you had uh, a lot of information and also uh, you were encouraged to do uh, analysis probably in another way. And so you see that uh, having different approaches may be very useful for for any kind of research. And also, I think it was very useful also to have a final talk where we can see why we are wish willing to have get to get high quality sequences at all. So thank to everybody um, and uh, the best luck with your research. <laughs>